So this is a Compass to Care program. This is Compass to Care Reaching Rural America and Beyond. My name is Stuart Schlossman. I'm a multiple sclerosis patient. I'm also president and founder of MS Views and News. And today we have we have two speakers for today's program. Again, this was supposed to be live in in Greenville, South Carolina. But before I introduce you to them, I want to show you our supporters for this event. We have Genentech, Novartis, Biogen, EMD, Serono, and Santa Fe Genzyme. And so today we have two very important people in the South Carolina area and beyond, right? And we have Bree Ray, and Bree Ray is a Pilates instructor, and she will be speaking first. She'll be speaking for about uh, 30 minutes, 35 minutes, and then doing a Q&A. So if anybody has questions, have them prepared, use the, um, the scroll on the top right of your screen or wherever it might be, the orange box, click on that arrow, okay, and uh, type in your questions that you might have for Bree. Following Bree, we're going to have Dr. Mary Hughes speak. And Dr. Mary Hughes, I mean, you guys got to know her, right? Um, if you don't, you've been missing out. <clears throat> you've been missing out on not only great health care, but great health care with a very empathetic person who really, really does care about you more than she probably even cares about being a doctor. All right. She really does care about your health. So, um, so we hope that. <clears throat> You'll be there listening with Dr. Hughes as well. And when Dr. Dr. Hughes will speak about 45 or 50 minutes and then following her talk, we'll do another Q&A. OK. All right. Great. So, Bree, we got you here. All right, Bree, everybody. Again, she's a Pilates instructor. For those who have been following our Pilates class uh, once a month, we have been doing this with Bree. And um, originally, our classes were going to end in September, but we just renewed. All right. So we're going to be doing this now definitely through the end of this year, right up until the end of December. And hopefully we could bring this back in January as well and, and do it for all of 2022. So if you're not yet registered for that once a month class, go to the MS Views and News website. In the center column is a list of events and you can find where Bree's banner is on that page and just get to the um, click on the link and you can get registered and find out when our programs are happening. All right. But for today. Bree's going to do a little bit of talk about Pilates. She's going to do a little bit about a demo on Pilates, and then we'll take your questions. All right. Take it away, Bree. All right. Thank you so much, Stuart. Um, and hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. My name is, like everyone has been saying, Bree Ray. I'm a Pilates instructor here in the Greenville area. So if you are a local to the area, um, you can find me at a local business downtown called Core Grow Strong. That's located at 1501 East North Street. And then you can also come to me. I teach out of my home um, as a Pilates instructor, working with ranges of, of clients. If you're an athlete, a runner, if you have MS, or if you have any other sort of like injury or ailment, Pilates is for everybody. Um, and it's for everybody's body. Like anyone can do it. And that's what we're going to be talking about today is why people with MS should be incorporating Pilates into their, their lifestyles, into their movements. Okay. So moving on, um, some optional and useful toys I say toys or just tools that you can use for today. And this is actually the moves that we're going to be going through are some of the moves that Stuart was talking about that we go over in our, um, Pilates monthly movement classes. Um, so some optional useful toys. I have a squishy ball or in, in, in lieu of that, you can use a pillow or you can also have a, a stretchy band. And in lieu of that, you can use like a long sleeve shirt that does have some give to it um, to change out. Or if you didn't have those props, um, use those instead. Okay. So when we talk about Pilates, a lot of people think about like maybe what they see on social media. Pilates is a lot of a lot of women, a lot of very flexible individuals, a lot of like toys and apparatuses and like scary looking things in pictures or videos that you may see about Pilates. Or if you didn't even know anything about Pilates, like what is it? It's actually a man, okay? It being a system and a man. So this is Joseph Pilates at the ripe age of 57 on the left. And then on the right, that's him at 82, a year before he died. Um, not a lot changed because he was always doing Pilates or at the time it was called Contrology. He was always doing it. He was always very aware of his body and how it was moving through life. Okay. So it's a lifestyle. It's not just a workout. 
Next slide. So, so with it being a system, it started off as a mat series. So you can do it anywhere. It's, it's very, it can be similar to yoga, but it is more rep based where you'll be doing anywhere from say four to anywhere like 16 reps of a certain exercise. So this is a very uh, famous move called the teaser that you may hear about or see in Pilates. Next slide. And so with the, the stereotype of a lot of women do do Pilates, um, as you can tell, it's, it's, it was invented by a man, but a lot of men can gain benefit from it too. We're always trying to find more ways to release tension in the body, to let go of tension in the body. And by bringing movement and having the kind of feedback from different tools like a band or a ball or a pillow or a shirt, um, you can find more ranges or even limitations to your movement. Okay. And then this is just another like beautiful picture of Pilates working with an individual who is getting not only support as you see with her legs, but also resistance that you see in her arms. So all of these springs and like almost like crazy looking apparatuses that you may see in Pilates are things to help assist you with your movements. It's not something to make something harder. It's actually to help and gain assistance through the movement. Next slide. So when we talk about what Pilates is, it's very low impact, in, low impact ex exercises to strengthen the muscles around your joints, to give it more support, as well as lengthen the connective tissue in the body. When we talk about movements that enhance posture, we're talking about the shoulders pulling down and back, the head lifting up and the neck staying long, alignment of the spine from north to south, um, and core strength. Can you hold your spine up tall and keep your core or the midsection of your belly engaged? Um, and with, with that comes a complete overall body control. So the emotions in Pilates are centered around breath and control. There, you'll see that word pop up a lot, especially in today's um, presentation. But it's a way for you to connect the mind to the body. So when we talk about the breath or one of the principles of Pilates, as we'll get to in the next slide, um, it's very fundamental. He always like he he said, if you're not breathing right, you're not going to be able to do anything right. Um, so finally, it's a way of life. If you can take the Pilates principles and apply it to everyday life, then you'll start to feel more in control of your own body, of your own mind, of your thoughts, of your movements. It's a domino effect. It's amazing. So benefits of Pilates with MS come from the six main principles of Pilates. The breath, which we'll be going over next, centering, which is the center of your body. So if we were starfish, like, or where's your belly button, find the centering of the center of your body. When we talk about control, we're trying to control our movements. Can you reach your right arm with control out in front of you and out to the side of you, down to the side of you, or you just kind of like flopping the arm around? When it comes to concentration, it really does take like that focus of moving one part of your body while another moves back and forth, reciprocal to it. Okay, the precision of the movement, if we were taking pictures and like, okay, this is seated in a chair, knee lift, this is seated in a chair, leg lift, would you be able to do it with the same type of precision that we would need it to put into like a textbook almost? And then finally, how do we create flow from your movement from one movement to the next? So if your arm is down by the side and you're lifting it up to the side, can you flow from one to the next with that sense of control? It almost looks like robotic in a way. All right. So now on to the next slide. We talk about the breath. Breath is the most important part of Pilates, in my opinion. And from what I've read and learned about Pilates himself is that it was the important, most important part of Pilates in ultimately. <laughs> So it supplies the brain, the body with oxygen, nutrients, energy, blood, all of the things that you need to continue moving, to continue living. If you think about it, you can go days without food, a um, couple less days without water, but mere minutes without the breath. So it's something that a lot of us can take for granted. So I want you to take your band or if you've got a long sleeve shirt, you can even use a towel or a blanket. I want you to wrap it around the back side of your body. Okay, so these are the demo moves that you can follow along with. And you're going to take the opposite bands into your hands. Well, that kind of rhymes. Opposite bands into your hands. So once those tail ends are into your hands, I want you to take a big breath in. Just hold them tight. So as you take a big breath in, I want you to try to push out against that band. And as you exhale, try to tighten the band a little more. As you're inhaling and exhaling, 
this is the difference between like a big breath or a belly breath versus like a shallow chest breath. So keep going with this breath. But what you're doing is you're stimulating the vagus nerve. It's the biggest, longest nerve in the body. Connects to a lot of different pieces, especially organs in the body. So when you're breathing, you're stimulating that vagus nerve. You're putting a little bit of pressure on it. And that's sending a signal back to the body to say like, all right, we're getting real. It's getting, it's time to start working or to pay attention to what's going on in the body. You're turning on your automatic nervous system, the parasympath parasympathetic state. So the relaxation contraction of the muscles, when you're breathing in and out, you're contracting or expanding, excuse me, you're expanding the diaphragm. And as you exhale, you're contracting it in, you're pulling the rib cage together. So this is a whole body integration as you start to realize that breathing isn't just like, it doesn't have to be something that you do automatically. It's something that you can be in control of. Okay. So let, letting yourself be present and let it be your anchor to the movement. Okay, so next slide. So now we talk about centering, the center of your body. So if you look off to the picture on the right-hand side, you'll see a box, and that is like your powerhouse, the box or the core where the center of the body is. This provides stability for the spine, stability and protection for your organs, but also, as you may have noticed with the breath, that diaphragm at the top of that box is also a part of the core. So if your diaphragm, which is the muscle that sits right underneath of your rib cage, when you breathe in, it kind of lowers down and expands out. But when you breathe out, it comes back together and lifts up. Okay. So as all of that is happening, that's working a part of your core. We, even when you're breathing. So if you're breathing and that's your Pilates, you are still doing Pilates. And this is again, why it's a lifestyle. Okay, so we're connecting the piece of the upper body piece of your the upper piece of your body to the lower piece of the body with that center. So bringing your awareness now, bringing your your band or your towel or your shirt to your waist. Okay, so now as you breathe in, try to expand that band, and as you breathe out, try to tighten the band a little bit further and feel how the muscles can also pull away from that band. So imagine it's like a belt or a corset that is tightening, tightening, tightening. And those are your muscles that are happening. That's called your transverse abdominus, literally wraps around like a corset and you'll feel the belly button pulling in towards the spine. Now on the back side, you have your spine or your multifidus muscles, your multifidi, and that just helps you to provide more support to the spine. And finally, you have your pelvic floor. So this one can um, be a little little uh, tricky to, to cue. So take your ball or your pillow in between your legs. I'm going to scoot back just a little bit. So with that ball or um, pillow between the legs, you're going to exhale and give it a big squeeze with your thighs. As you inhale, allow the legs to kind of release and exhale, squeeze again using those thighs. So as all this is happening, you can still have the band kind of tightening on the waist, pulling the belly button to the spine. But I want you to feel that when you're pushing in on that ball, when you're squeezing that ball, do you feel any sort of like lift up inside of you? And it, it almost feels like you're trying to like pick something up um, that you're sitting on. Okay. So imagine you're sitting on something and you're trying to pull it up inside of you. So that's a, a great way to kind of like find or feel the powerhouse or the core of your body or the center of your body. Next slide. So when we're talking about the control of the movements, the goal is always to be in control of your body, to, to be able to lift the arm out to the side. So go ahead and, and do that move with me as you lift both arms out to the side. Do you notice if maybe one side feels a little heavier or a little lighter, or maybe it doesn't lift as high as one side or the other, which is totally fine. These are things I want you to notice with your body, okay, that you pay attention to so that we can get that mind to muscle connection. It's very helpful if you like watch yourself in a mirror or in a camera and you can play back the video and, and give yourself feedback tools of lifting the arm on maybe the side that doesn't lift as high. So moving your body with your mind, if you take away all the systems in the body, you have just your nervous system left, you can still see the body. So at any point in time, the body is connected to even the fingertips and the toes. Um, 
when we're talking about that control, it really just takes practice, practice, practice. And we'll, we'll come up, we'll, we'll talk about concentration, like neuroplasticity on the next slide, but any improvements to um, your movement is going to, to, to be where you can practice and get better. So when we concentrate on something, you have the breath, you have the centering, like that breath, how it exhales and feels the center of your body. And then you have the control of the movement and all of that added together gives you concentration. So when you're thinking about what the breath is doing, when you're thinking about how the core is activating, and when you're thinking about how you're moving, you can't concentrate on anything else. You can't think about like how your laundry list of things to do has to get checked off. You have to be in control right now. And so this is like the, I, I, tell, I tell my students, this is the best hour that, or the fastest hour you'll ever have because you are only concentrating at this present moment with what you're doing. Um, so neuroplasticity is building those new pathways and neural networks to move. So if we are continuing to practice staying in control, moving with the breath, being in control of the center of the body, then what that does is it helps to build new neural pathways for movement. Okay. So your body can start to be like, okay, if I need to lift my right arm just a little higher, can that happen? Like, can I get there? If I continue practicing, like what muscles need to be recruited to get that arm to lift a little bit higher? Next slide. And then coming up, so we're talking about precision. So when we talk about the precise movement of things, um, we need to talk about like how your awareness is outside of you versus your awareness inside of you. So when we talk about things like proprioception, that is the ability to like, if all the lights were turned off and you closed your eyes, would you still be able to find your nose? Would you still be able to find your ear? Would you be able to balance on one leg? Would you be able to find something around you in the room? Proprioception, your awareness of what's going on outside of the body. So now interoception, what's going on inside of the body, practice this right now, right here with me. So rest the hands onto the lap. If the ball or the pillow is still between the legs, do you notice like how it's kind of giving you a little feedback? If you squeeze it, it kind of pushes back against you. Do you notice how the breath is coming and going? Does it still feel like you're taking those big belly breaths? Or does it feel like you're just shallowly breathing into the top part of your throat and chest? Do you notice your heart beating? Do you hear it beating? Can you feel it beating? Do you notice how your feet are maybe placed onto the ground underneath of you or how your bottom is on the chair underneath of you? Is your weight shifted more to the right or to the left? Or does it feel like your head is kind of tilted to the left or to the right? All of these things that you're starting to maybe become aware of or blossom your awareness from is the whole body as a system, okay? So your awareness of everything, and then how can we turn that into movement? Can your awareness turn into a heel lift of those heels off the ground? So now that just the toes are onto the ground, or maybe a toe lift, try those. So if your heels are on the ground, you're lifting the heels, just the heels. And if your toes are on, or then pulling the toes up away from the ground, and notice how when that happens, maybe your whole body has to move back and forth with you to get those movements to happen. These are just things to become aware of so that when we get the precise movement down or the form and the alignment of the movements down, that we can do it with that precision. Okay, next slide. Finally, we get to talk about flow. And this is like where everything just comes together. The fluidity of movement, the ease, the grace, the efficiency of that movement creates flow um, with any routine that you, that you may be doing or movement that you may be doing. Um, so it's that, that from point A to point B or from having the hand low down by your side to up by your side, point A, point B, can you do it with ease, with grace, with fluidity? Okay, so an exploration of what the body is capable of doing when you put all of those six principles, the breath, the center, the control, the concentration, the focus and the flow all together, or excuse me, the precision and the flow all together. So this is where we can have a little bit of like playtime with the movement where your ball or your pole is between the legs 
and your band is going to be behind the back, right underneath of the shoulder blades. So you'll see it right there. So you'll take the same tails into the hands here. And for now, just resting the elbows next to the side, okay? Holding tight with that band, just holding by the side, okay? So now as you exhale, I want you to give a good squeeze on that ball and try to pick yourself up a little taller. So sit a little taller. Now, can you hold that length? Inhale, open the knees and exhale, close. As all of this is happening, use the breath to set the pace and close in on that ball like you're trying to get your knees to touch and inhale, open. All while keeping the spine tall, that pelvic floor lifting up and in. Remember, it feels like you want to kind of pick something up off of the chair that you're sitting on. The ribs each time you exhale are coming together. And the belly button is coming towards the spine, like you're trying to pull your waistband or your shirt towards your spine. Okay, so now as you're squeezing that ball, I want to invite you to maybe reach the arms out in front of you. And then as you inhale, bend the elbows and release that squeeze on the ball. Exhale, squeeze the pillow of the ball as you reach the arms long, and then pull back in. As you continue moving in and out, out and in, notice how the ball is still just getting that squeeze. And now we've added the movement of the arms out and in. Okay, so we're going to add another layer on so that when the arms go up or out to the out in front of you, I want you to then pull them out to the side. Keep that squeeze on the ball as you pull them back in and then release the squeeze on the ball, pull the elbows in. So now that whole time as you press the arms out, squeeze, squeeze, squeeze the ball, open the arms out to the side and then push back out in front of you and then release the squeeze on the ball as you bend your elbows back in. So here it is from the front, squeeze and reach, open out to the sides, still squeezing that ball and then pull the arms back in and bend, okay? Opening out to the side, pressing, inhaling to bend and release. Try to, if you can, exhale the whole time that your arms are going out and in and then when you pull back in, inhale. So it sounds and looks like this. Okay, now take a break. Maybe you start to breathe normally, but where do you feel the tension or the muscular engagement that was happening in the body? Maybe in the inner thighs because you kept squeezing and trying to close the legs together. Maybe in the core because you felt that transverse abdominus or that corset or like almost belt-like muscle wrapping around and helping to pull the belly button up and in. Did you feel the pelvic floor trying to pick up whatever it is that you're sitting on, as you felt the diaphragm trying to wrap the ribs in and towards each other, okay? All of the epiphytus or the back muscles were trying to help you stay tall rather than kind of caving back or slumping down, okay? So let's try one more demo move. You're gonna place the ball, this time um, underneath of the right foot. Demo this, look down, okay, sorry about that. Okay, so the ball is going to go, ball or pillow is going to go underneath of the right foot. Mm -mm -mm. And if um, one side is a little bit more challenged than the other, this is where I recommend definitely a pillow instead of a, a more circular motion, uh, object here so it doesn't roll away from you. That band now, you're going to take it out in front of you, band or shirt out in front of you, and just let the arms rest down into the lap. So now as you exhale, press the foot into the ball or the pillow, and then inhale, lift it back up. As you're exhaling to press down, try to notice what else is happening in the body. Most of the time, what I see wanting to happen is you want to curve and like really press all your weight into it. No, don't do that. Let's just press. Can you press by using your core, pulling that belly button in, and you'll feel the leg activating a little bit, but it's going to be more of that centering body of that powerhouse, pressing the foot down and making sure that you can stay lifted instead of just collapsing, okay? So now that's the movement that's going to happen with the leg. The movement comes from the core. If you still have that band in between your hands, you know, out in front of you is where it's going to go. So we're gonna reach it out in front of you as you push down into that ball 
And then lower the arms back down as you lift away from the ball. Press the arms out in front, push the ball. Lower the arms down, lift away from the ball. Okay, so here, that's your movement. Okay, so notice how we started off with just the foot. We got the alignment, we got the precision of the foot pressing down, the spine staying tall. Now we added in another layer, okay? So the fluidity or the ease of doing one exercise then becomes a challenge to add another exercise to it, okay? To sync up the movement from one to the next. Now, here's your next layer. If this starts to feel very easy, very fluid, very like systematic, when you push down on that ball, when you reach the arms out, the next time you reach the arms out, I want you to really then pull them apart like you're trying to get that band across the chest and then pull back in, lift the foot back up, lower the hands down. So it's a whole exhale out with the arms, back in with the arms and then inhale, pull back in. So it looks and sounds like this. Okay, now if you'd like your arms to get a little bit of a break, you can place the band down and instead keep your arms in like genie arm position or even prayer hands. Um, if you want to keep using the band, keep reaching it out in front of you as you press the ball down. But what we're now going to add is a little bit of rotation. So this is a full body workout, including the brain. So you have to think about it. Let's start from the top. I'm going to show you this from the front. The ball is still, let's, let's change it over to the left side. Give that left leg a little, little movement there. And now as you're pressing that leg down, notice it might feel a little different than the other side. Okay. So now the arms are getting a little break. So now everyone may be able to come in and grab onto that band after the arms have a little break. So now as you're pressing down on that ball, remember you're trying not to just collapse forward into the ball, but to stay lifted and tall. The navel pulling in towards the spine, those ribs wrapping in and together as that pelvic floor pulls up and in. Okay. Now, while that's happening, grab onto your band and reach out in front as you push down in the ball. Lower the band, lift the leg, press the band out and push the ball down. Okay, so just like we did on the right side. But now what we're going to do is press down, reach out, and can you twist to the left and then twist back center? all while keeping that middle of the band right in front of the heart, okay? So twist to the right this time, and then come back center, lifting the leg off the ball. While all of this is happening, keep alternating from left to right. Can you keep the height of your spine? Anytime we rotate, it's gonna be natural for us to kind of wanna like collapse down. But by keeping yourself lifted, we can just bring more of that stability, awareness into that center. So now if you don't want the band, either prayer or genie the arms, okay, as you're pressing down and you can still rotate. And if you have prayer, prayered the hands, the, the thumbs in front of the heart is a great way, an easy way to make sure that you're not like pushing just the hands off to the side, but that you are rotating the whole torso from one side to the next. Okay. All right, good. Now from there, let's go to the next slide. And while you're here seated, after that movement, after we've gotten some blood flowing and the breath moving through the body, I want you to close the eyes. Close the eyes and what do you notice going on outside of the body? Maybe you not only hear my voice, but maybe something going off in a distant room or outside of your home. And then turn your attention within. And what do you notice going on inside of the body? Maybe the breath is starting to, to calm down, to come down. Maybe you notice the heartbeat starting to slow down. Or maybe you feel it like pulsing a little bit more intensely after that movement. Where is the breath? Notice if you're still breathing deep into the belly. Or has it started to come up into the upper chest, more shallow breathing? The deeper the breath, the more oxygen, the nutrients, and air flow that you can bring to the muscles, to the body, to the brain. 
And now thinking about where is the mind? Meaning, is your mind racing to all the thoughts of things that you have to do today or that you have to do tomorrow? Or are you right here, right now? Are you able to be here in the present moment? When you think about where the body is, I want you to think about whether it's shifted or it feels heavy more on the right side versus the left side. Does it feel like it's turned to one side or the other side? Or does it feel like it's slumping forward or leaning back? Now, I want you to bring your awareness to where any tensity is in the body. Imagine that the breath that's coming into the body, into that space where it's tense, is helping to almost expand that tissue. And as you exhale, pull that tension, that tensity out away from the body. And now notice where the body is soft. Where do you feel it kind of just letting itself be? And can you breathe into that space and try to exhale that softness to the places of the body where they may have felt tense. And keeping the eyes closed, just take any notes, pay attention to what's going on within and outside of the body. Moving on. And then as you open your eyes, if you would like to get in touch with me, or if you have any questions about this presentation that I gave to you today, my email is at the bottom of that slide. You can find me in the local Greenville area at that address at Core Grow Strong, um, or you can email me with any other kind of questions or um, email restaurants you want to send my way. So I just wanted to say thank you again, everybody. These are the resources I used to put together the slides. Um, if anyone has any questions, we'll be going over that here momentarily. Um, so did anyone submit any questions? Otherwise, we can keep demoing for the time that I have remaining. Yes, we have questions. But thank you. Thank you, Brie. This was awesome. Even I got to benefit from some of this listening to this. One of these days, I'll get to try it all. But for right now, I just want to um, ask you some questions and we'll go on to the next one. All right. Okay. First off, first off, how, um, how long does it take like somebody to get to a master level of this? Mm, depends on what master level is. Um, master level can can be in control and a master of your movements from getting up out of bed in the morning to sitting down into a chair without pain. Um, so it is a little objective um, or, or excuse me, subjective uh, for what mastering uh, the movement is. With Pilates, it, it's taken me you know, the six years that I've been doing it for, and I'm still not a master, but that's because I'm always learning and I'm always sure. finding out new things. So, sure. I don't, yeah. Okay. All right. Next, um, how often per day or daily or per week should a person be practicing Pilates? Uh, you can do Pilates any every day if you wanted to. Um, they are movements that, like we talked about in the presentation, they strengthen the muscles around the joints as well as lengthen the tissue um, that connects everything together um, called the fascia. So if you're doing this exercise or this movement routine every day, um, you'll see benefits faster or sooner, um, but you can do it once a week too. Like you can add it to a complement to complement what you may already be doing. You can do it once a week and ramp yourself up two, two times a week, three times a week, four times a week. Any kind of movement to answer your question is going to be beneficial. Um, but if you can move every day, it's going to be like, tenfold beneficial <laughs> okay so when a person first starts beginning pilates can they expect that they're going to be sore um they may be yeah they may be because i a lot of the clients that i work with uh most people breathe shallowly so just finding that deep breath where you're breathing and expanding the ribs out and in they may be sore in these muscles right here because they aren't aware that you can even pull the ribs together and use that diaphragm to really bring that breath out of the body um, so soreness may, is, is probably going to be expected if you haven't done anything. Yeah, it's probably going to happen. Yeah. So can you, uh, please, uh, expand on that a little bit and tell everybody that, well, obviously you just said that they are going to get a little bit sore, 
but what what is best for them to do for that soreness rather than give up? Rather than give up, yes. Um, so if you do feel sore, um, or if you're if you're worried about feeling sore, start with just five minutes a day, ten minutes a day. Work your way up, ramp your way up, because the body responds. Um, it responds to change. It's uh, you know the 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 demands that you're putting on your body. It will adapt to them. So the adaptable changes that's happening over time, it's, um, then you won't be as sore. So if you're starting off slowly, five, 10 minutes, 15 minutes a day, and you're like, mm, okay, I wasn't sore. That's good. Then try 20 minutes a day. If you're still not sore, that like, that should never be like an indication of like, I did nothing. So I did it wrong. So I like soreness should never be something that you're looking for as an indication that you did something in a workout, but it is an indicator that it is something new that you're uh, demanding your body to do or to train for or to right. move for. Um, I hope that answered your question. It answers the question of who asked it. Yes. Okay. okay. Great. All right. Does um, awareness of muscle movement always happen? And if so, for how long? Um, it doesn't always happen. No, it doesn't always happen. Awareness of the muscle moving specifically does not always happen. Um, so I, I work with a couple of clients who, like, I'll ask them where they feel it if their arm is lifting up to the side. And typically what's happening is the deltoid is helping to pull that muscle up. You know, there's other supporting muscles around the shoulder that are also happening, but so is the core. The core is helping you to like not lean the body over to the side to lift the arm up. Instead, it's stabilizing you. So there might, there will, there will be things working. And if you can lift the arm with like good enough form, then like, then you may start to become aware of how other pieces of the body are stabilizing or mobilizing. Um, so it doesn't have to be a requirement for movement if you're like, oh, but I don't notice it happening here. I don't notice it happening here. If you're moving, then something's happening. And then it'll, it'll, it takes, it takes a little bit of practice to become aware of it. Okay, great. Not wanting to take anything away from you, but do wanting to remind people that came in late that following this Q and A, we are going to have the, uh, the next talk with Dr. Mary Hughes. Okay. And that has a lot of different things to do with multiple sclerosis. So stay tuned, everybody. Even when this ends, stay tuned. Like as if you're on a TV show, right? All right. <laughs> so, um, going, going back to something that you just said and, uh, about the deltoids and, and arm, uh, muscles and whatnot reminded me, I have a very bad shoulder. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have a rotator cuff problem. All right. Now, what is too much to do? How I can't read, I, you can't see because I'm black on black. All right. But how far up can I move my arm? Uh, to Safe. a point where there is no, where there is not pain. Right. Um, so that, that well, may be where you have to hold your elbow into the side and work on these movements. Right. Um, as long as you're staying out of pain and eventually working up to like where your arm has a little bit of space there and moving there. So eventually being able to lift the arm to a pain free range of motion to a point where it's like, okay, then you can lift high enough. But rotator cuff, um, that's a tough one. Like make sure you're seeing like a physical therapist working to strengthen the right kinds of muscles. Um, Pil yeah, Pilates can help with that, but it is not like the magic pill for everything. Sure, sure. Thank you for that. All right. When arms are lifting or reaching away from the body, are you pushing away with strength or just gentle motion? Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't know if I understand the question, uh, completely, but, when, um, go ahead. I think when you're, when you have your arm out, are you, mm -hmm. or going, do you go forward? You can. You, are you supposed, with, with, are you supposed pushing, to go, sorry, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's, let me just read the question again. When arms are lifting or reaching away from the body, are you pushing away with strength? I think it takes strength to move your arm regardless, right? But are you supposed to yeah. do it uh, more rigid or just more relaxed is what I'm thinking about. Oh, okay. Um, I, I understand that. Um, so when at, at least how I, I move and how I teach in Pilates is that there is always energy in the body. So, so when I'm reaching out, I am like spreading or keeping my fingers together and trying to reach as far as I can 
out to the side. And if you're trying to reach from the tips of your fingers all the way out, that will keep the whole arm active, not just lazy. Got it. Got it. Okay? Thank so you if for you, that. Yeah. If your arm is just reaching out, that's like, you can kind of see it happening, like how my shoulder is lifting up towards the ear, which we don't want. But if you're reaching out, then that shoulder will stay down. The neck will stay long. Great. Now, while you're standing, um, question next is, what differences are there in Pilates between standing and sitting? Um, there are a, there, well, the, mostly that there's more lower body exercises. You can still do lower body exercises um, while seated. Um, so, for example, like how we had the ball underneath of our foot um, previously, but you can also, if your chair had a back or doesn't have a back, you can lean back and lift your legs up and down. So these are some of the exercises that you can do while seated, but same kind of exercises. Sorry, I'm about to like cut my head off, but same kind of exercise that you can do while standing. But it does take a little bit more of that control or that sense of control to make sure that when you're seated, your body isn't going to lift and lower or wobble from side to side. Same thing as when you're standing, that when you're lifting your leg up and down, see how my body's kind of like shifting from side to side? Can you keep that shift to a very like minimum while you're controlling and not leaning off to one side or shifting to one side? Okay. okay. That's right. I was going to ask you to do a demo, so I'm glad you did that. All right. Okay. So <laughs> next question we have, is your pelvic floor always engaged during your day? And before you answer that, if anybody listening right now has any questions, please use the question box to type in your question. All right. Because I'm running out from what I've already acquired. So ask your questions. OK, so back to that. Um, is your pelvic floor always engaged during your day? Um, it does not necessarily, it's not always engaged. Um, so when you're thinking about the pelvic floor, you want to think of it like a trampoline. So it's a, it's a sling or a hammock of muscles that rests at the base of your spine or right between your legs. And so anytime that you're exhaling, you're trying to pull it up and in, at least when you're consciously aware of it. You don't have to do that every time you're breathing because then you're just like, hold on, <sighs> let me engage my pelvic floor and then we can talk. That's not how it should go. Like it, it, you want it to be become a kind of subconscious effort to pull, to pull it up and in so that you give the support that you need to your organs so they don't fall out from you, um, to give yourself that sense of support so you don't have any kind of leakage, um, urinary or fecal. Um, it's, it's a very important set of muscles that not a lot of people are, are know about or readily able to talk about. Um, but to answer the question, long story short is no, it does not have to be like engaged hundred percent all throughout the day. You want to think of it like a trampoline where it, where it relaxes that point and then pulls itself up at points. It gives you that sort of support at all points and times during the day. It does, it doesn't just like relax and let go at any time. Okay. I don't know if I asked this already or not, but I don't think I did. So I will ask. And even if I did ask, I'm asking again. All right. Okay. Now that was that was really good thought of, right? All right. So, does awareness of muscle movement always happen, and if so, for how long? Okay, I did. Oh, ask. you did ask this, I was told and, I, did and ask. I didn't. But I didn't answer the if for so if for how long. Um, right. So, muscle movement. Yes, I answered that. It doesn't always have to happen where you're aware of which muscles are contracting or engaging, um, but it takes um, it takes a lot of people different time lengths um, to become aware of the body or different parts of the body. And so um, with some, like some people who have like the whole right side is a little bit more challenged than the left side. Um, it may take your right side a little bit more effort, more focus, more concentration to become aware of, even though I'm lifting my right arm or I'm lifting my right leg, like, but I don't feel those muscles working it, it may take a little bit more feedback, more stimulation from various props or various tools that you may use in certain classes. So, for example, like with a ball or with a pillow, if, say, your right side is maybe it doesn't feel as much as, as the left side does. So when you place something like a ball or a pillow between the legs, just feeling how it feels on the left versus the right can give the, the brain and the body a sort of like mimic um, awareness of like, okay, well, if this is how it feels on this side, can I sort of become aware of that feeling on the right side? Okay. So 
to answer your question, everybody is different, but there are things that you can use that you can like pull out of your toolbox to kind of bring more of the feedback or more of the sensory um, aspect to your practice, to your movement. Okay. All right. I don't have any more questions. I would love to just say thank you for doing all that you did today. I think we did yeah. the demos and whatnot. And and I, this was fabulous. I can't wait to get it onto our YouTube channel and show everybody else that's out there what they missed today. And, you know, maybe we could get more people to come online to the monthly class. And eventually maybe we could get to doing that twice a month. That would be pretty awesome as well. Right. And maybe, be, yeah. and maybe you could even get me to do this. <laughs> Maybe. Um, so for those of, for, for the people who are tuning in right now and they are, um, asking about the September class, when is that again on, on September? I think it's the 21st. Is that right, Stuart? I don't have that in front of me. Okay. Um, it's on our website. No, it's September 7th. Um, September 7th from 7 okay. to 8. That's right. That's um, a Tuesday. So that's, yeah. So yeah, this month in up. September, instead of it being on a Monday, it's on a Tuesday. And that's only because Labor Day is the day prior. So, OK, mm -hmm. so we change that out. OK, well, Bree, I want to thank you very much for doing this and we look yeah, forward to you. seeing you again. All right. Thank, thank you. you. And now, that's everybody, good. we have Hello. Dr. Mary Hughes and Dr. Hughes. First off, thank you again, Bree. And, and Dr. Hughes, we're welcoming you onto the program right now. And there's so much to say about Dr. Hughes and not enough time to say it all. So I'm not going to say much at all. And we'll let her talk about herself. All right. And um, we do have that Dr. Hughes is with Premier Neurology and Lifestyle Neurology in Greer, South Carolina. All right. And for anybody, especially for those within driving distance to that area. If you're only seeing a general neurologist, I tell people all the time that they need to see an MS specialist. And Dr. Hughes is an MS specialist. So if you can get to see her, it would be to your benefit that you do. Dr. Hughes is going to be speaking today for about 50, five zero minutes. And then we're going to do, I don't know, 40, 45 minute Q&A, something like that. Maybe her talk is only 45 minutes, somewhere in there. But we, there's a lot to talk about. She's going to be speaking about just, you know, basics about MS, COVID-19, the vaccines. Um, she's going to speak about access to care, um, telehealth, all mixed in together, right? So she's only going to be speaking. Just listen to her because there are no slides. And, um, and we'll get back to you. Again, I'm going to tell you, though, that if you have any questions, so please click on the box and um, type in any questions that you have, and we will answer them all later on. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you, Stuart. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to present. And I have to laugh. I was kept staring at my like what my my webcam looks like and saying, I, what's what's different? And I realized I changed my regular bulb out to a grow light. Uh, because uh, during the pandemic, um, I have comforted myself, I have stimulated myself. I have found peace with a lot of working with plants and crafting around plants. So no, I'm not using a filter, although I kind of like the effect, um, but it is my grow light and uh, I forgot that that's what I had changed it to. You really only notice it when you put it on the webcam. Um, so Stuart always just kind of challenges me uh, to speak on lots of things. And uh, so I always kind of say, nobody's ever had trouble with me not talking long enough. Um, but I sent out a, a Facebook blast. Uh, those of you who know me, I, um, I am not a technological person um, because I did get a chance to just see bit of Bree's presentation beforehand, and it's fabulous. And, and Bree, I don't know, I didn't realize that I've had friends that are texting me and say, oh, she taught me Pilates. Um, so you really are a really great resource uh, for our community, and thank you. Um, I have a very remote history with Pilates. I always kind of laugh and say, at least I didn't kill myself on the reformer uh, machine. Uh, and I do remember it fondly. I haven't done it recently. Um, but, but this week uh, I had a patient come in who I was prepared to do uh, Botox injections for uh, spasticity in her left leg. And I mixed the medicine and uh, I was all ready to go. And then I said, well, let me see her walk. Uh, she had a new brace. I said, let's see, see, what are we actually going after? And when she walked, I said, well, that's a lot better. 
Um, and then when I examined her, I said, I can't find the spasticity that I was going to inject you for. Um, so a very sad story is I poured the Botox down the sink. Um, what's your secret? What has she been doing for the last nine months? She's been doing Pilates. Um, and it's been amazing to see the strength come back, uh, to see the muscles. Um, where, you know, she said she always had chicken legs. Uh, I think she said that. Maybe that was my thought. Um, but she'd always had chicken legs. And now you can feel the calf muscles. Um, is it where it was when she was 20? No. But she had had some very advanced atrophy. And you can see the improvement. Uh, and just to see the improvement in her function. Um, so when people ask us, like, what's, what are the important things? What's symptomatic management for MS? Um, I'm hearing a lot of ums. Um, the, uh, the first thing we try to talk about is wellness. When people come to us and say, well, I'm really fatigued, uh, and I ask, are you exercising? The, most often the response is, did you hear me? I just told you I was very fatigued. Uh, and study after study, I hate when science just tells us uh, things that we sort of already knew. But exercise matters. Moving matters. Um, Stuart was challenging me to do uh, some of the Pilates with uh, Bree this morning. And I explained to him, I ex unfortunately got stung by a wasp in the back of my right leg and uh, it hurts. And I have a little gabapentin fuzziness in me. Uh, those of you who are on it have tried to tell me that it causes a little woozy. Uh, I apologize now, um, but I was just desperate to do something for the pain. Um, and but I thought the most remarkable comment was, well, I said, well, I can barely walk. I'm limping. And uh, Stuart said, what's wrong with your arms? Uh, and I hate when I hear my own advice come back to me. Is Pilates right for everybody? No. Um, but we can find exercise. That is our challenge, is to find an exercise regimen for everybody. Um, sometimes we have to use physical therapy as a bridge, uh, physical therapy for strengthening, physical therapy for balance, physical therapy to prepare you for an exercise regimen that can become uh, a part of your daily routine. Taking that time to say, uh, I need to take my medicines at this time. I need to do my exercise at this time. Uh, I can't emphasize how important it is and how rewarding it is for our standpoint to see people who come in and we know they've been exercising, that we can see a difference uh, in the strength. There's so much excitement uh, and, and source of hope when we're looking at the research that's being done, how much better we are uh, at slowing the progression of relapsing uh, MS, secondary progressive MS, and yes, primary progressive MS. Uh, we're doing everything we can. And of course, that's one of the first steps is how do we manage the disease process so that we don't have to worry as much about symptom management uh, being ahead of the curve? Um, but the other side is what do we do about now? Hey, to break it to you, your advice is the same as the advice I get. I should be exercising. I do. Um, two, three days a week. Uh, first thing I do when I get out of bed is I do my yoga routine. Can I teach a yoga class? No. Would a yoga uh, instructor recognize some of what I do as yoga? Maybe not. Um, but on the days that I do yoga, I can tell you right now, my days go better. I have chronic neck pain. Um, uh, the low back pain. Uh, I did tell Bree, uh, while I'm not doing your exercises with you, we do have the ball chairs in the office. And that's been a fabulous thing to try to work on the core um, and very comfortable. Should everybody be on a ball chair? No. Um, but I've tried to make things, uh, adapt things in my life that I can try to manage, uh, which essentially is kind of a chronic pain syndrome uh, with exercise. Uh, my mental health uh, on the days that I have done my yoga, which for me is very much a meditative experience. Uh, I face my outdoor porch, which uh, uh, is overflowing with plants. I can see the trees in the background. Uh, it's a beautiful view. Uh, taking the time to just appreciate uh, those few moments before I start 
which is commonly the chaos of my day, the running from one place to the other. Um, I think it's, it's important to talk about mental health uh, in the midst of uh, an ongoing COVID pandemic, amidst of regular life. A friend of mine drove through uh, last night very unexpectedly and said, I'm going to come for a visit at 10 o'clock at night. And I'm what are you visiting at 10 o'clock at night? Why don't you just spend the night? Uh, she was taking her son off to college. She will be an empty nester. I have been through that. I've also been through, and then he came back. Um, and uh, that is a big challenge. Uh, it's probably the closest that I can get to, to identifying with how has MS affected who you imagine yourself to be? How do you look at the changes that happen in your life and adapt to them? Because that is a big change. Uh, my identity for 21 years now has been mom, uh, physician, wife. But mom was front, second, one, two, and three. Did I exercise? No. Did I get my son to his soccer games? Yes. Um, did I eat well at the house? Well, I, I don't think I ate a hot meal for between medical school and working, and uh, but I made sure my son had happy uh, had hot meals, most of them balanced, not all of them. Um, and that time to say, how do we take this time to really say, I now need to take care of myself? I always did. I wish I had taken this advice many, many years ago, uh, and translating that every day. Uh, sometimes I will tell my patients, you know, I'm, I'm concerned lightning might strike, uh, but, I'm more, but I'm much more emphatic on the days I actually did my yoga uh, to say, the better you take care of the machine, the better you do. We can see it in the office. Uh, we see those who came to us and done exercising, uh, those who have completed physical therapy, who have uh, really engaged in their exercise regimen. Uh, and so I continue to encourage uh, finding what works for you. Uh, if you tell me I should start running, I, I personally don't like to run. If I'm running, somebody's chasing me. Um, I've never had that second wind or the runner's high. Uh, perhaps I never ran that far. Um, running is just not for me. Um, if you say to me yoga, well, I, it took me time to discover yoga. I tried jazzercise. Uh, another of my patients who I've just been really impressed with as far as the impact of exercise, she exercises four or five days a week and she does jazzercise. Uh, I can walk to the nearest jazzercise studio. And I did for a while. But uh, at the end of a busy day, uh, the loud music, the pounding, the I just wasn't a jazzercise person at that time. So finding something that meets my needs. In the last year, we've had to get really good about identifying resources uh, virtually. Uh, YouTube is now my best friend. Um, it's ironic for all those years that I told my son to get off YouTube that uh, at least daily, I'm giving a reference, a, uh, a suggestion that you check out a YouTube uh, video channel, I don't know the language, um, uh, for exercise, uh, chair yoga, chair exercises, uh, um, yoga, I love cold chants, uh, and yoga TX. Uh, there may be other really fabulous, and I'm sure there are, um, but I found her and I, I like her. Um, there are MS exercises for people with, I don't know, exercises for people with MS. I've watched the videos, I haven't tried them. But really learning to say, What's our excuse for not being able to exercise? Uh, I don't have a good one. Um, you really don't either. Uh, you can't talk about wellness without talking about nutrition. Uh, and your rules are the same as my rules, a good, healthy, well-balanced diet. I still, I think it was a poignant moment when I looked in my refrigerator, I think my son was probably about 10. And I realized I had all the four food groups equally represented. So we had pizza. We'd had Chinese food, we'd had Italian, and we'd had hamburgers. And there was evidence of all four of them. 
I will have to confess, I'm not so sure there were any vegetables in there. And uh, I looked at that and thought, I need to do better. Um, and also kind of coincide with the time that Michelle Obama was really pushed, encouraging children to learn how to garden. And uh, my son came home and said, we've got to grow our own vegetables. And I mentally thought, I'm going to shoot the teacher. It's like, I have time to do this. Uh, our, we grew green beans. Uh, our first harvest was exactly three green beans. Brought them in the house, washed them off, had them on the counter, and thought, uh, what am I going to do with three green beans? Went to the grocery store and bought a bought bag of green beans. And as I was getting ready to cook them, my son said, you're not going to put my green beans over with the store-bought green beans. Um, the good thing is he I went off to play. Um, I'm not sure if the three green beans he thought came from the garden were the actual three green beans. Uh, but if you fast forward, the little changes that I've made along the way, and I use my personal story because I am not, uh, I'm not a nutritionist. Uh, I'm not the best person to say, oh, no, you need exactly this many proteins. But we can find those people. There are resources to help us uh, identify that. Uh, many of you may be familiar with uh, the Walls um, diet. I've read the book. Uh, thank you, Katie. Uh, she gave me my own copy to make sure I could read the book. Uh, for the science, um, I, I, there is truth sometimes. But just because A is true and B is true doesn't mean if you do A, you're going to get to B. And that was my argument with the book. But from a nutritional standpoint, uh, one of the biggest changes is it took away that I should be eating more greens. And it's now a routine in our house. Um, Monday, we'll decide, is it going to be mustard greens? Are we going to do kale this week? There is always kind of a pot of greens. Little changes along the way. Uh, air fryer. Uh, I'm on my third, maybe fourth air fryer. I went for the Breville this time. Um, and it is fabulous. Uh, everything tastes better at air fryer. I don't feel like I am missing out. Um, and I don't think restricting yourself. Uh, if you say to me, well, I'm going to do uh, the best health and I'm never going to touch sugar and I'm never going to touch white bread and I'm never going to touch uh, potatoes or rice and I'm never going to have another uh, thing of ice cream. Well, the likelihood that that is sustainable um, is pretty low. Um, I personally can't stand cottage cheese. And if I try to do a diet that contains cottage cheese, well, I might be able to choke it down for a couple of weeks, but I assure you that is not gonna make a long-term change for me. Uh, one of the things we've done recently in the office uh, is we are, are really honored to have Adele uh, Freeman with us, who is a registered nutritionist. Um, uh, who can, uh, who is here because so many people ask me those questions. Uh, and it's not, I agree, easy to, I, uh, you would think you could just find a dietitian, like you could just find a dentist. Those are both very important. Shouldn't we see a dietitian twice a year, like we get our teeth checked twice a year? I see them as equal importance, but we don't have equal access to them. Um, and so trying to help with the access, uh, the gift I gave myself and my office is we all get a free visit with her. Um, if you want to do more, it's on you. Uh, it's in Christmas around here. Um, but seeing the recommendations, having that empowerment, say, what can I do uh, to continue uh, my healthy nutritional uh, journey? And it turns out it doesn't have to be one of uh, complete denial. Um, uh, during COVID 2020, uh, I will confess I did a lot of comfort eating and uh, I might or might not have put on around 30 pounds. I say that because I stopped weighing at 30 pounds uh, and, I, and I realized we couldn't keep going like that. Right. It, it's just not comfortable. Um, my clothes didn't fit well and we weren't really going out and shopping. So it wasn't like I could just run to the mall uh, um, and buy new clothes. Uh, Amazon's great, but uh, I haven't quite got to shopping on Amazon. I sew, but I also fast enough uh, to uh, keep my wardrobe uh, up with my Oreo fetish. Um, and so making those, I finally had to have a stop and just say, what are we going to do different? And uh, for me, it was joining Weight Watchers. Um, and the best thing about it was the community. 
is to know that I wasn't the only one who was comforting. I wasn't the only one who missed going to restaurants and was trying to figure out, can you actually do Waffle House? Um, um, I can't even remember what they are, the potatoes, uh, hash browns, scattered, smothered, covered, and chunked is my personal preference. Um, can you do that at the house? And it turns out, well, it's not quite Waffle House. Uh, it's a lot healthier. Um, but it took that away. So how do you create things? Um, that and the pandemic made me do that. It made me say, I really like go get like the time. I mean, it's it's just not the same. Uh, so going into the kitchen and, and creating uh, that is a lot of what nutritional dietary changes means. Um, and I think that's something that is uh, important. Um, we have uh, a vegan in our office, and I say that like you know, it's a vegan in my office, and I'm so impressed with her dedication to her. Uh, vegan lifestyle. But you know, the other secret is I am so impressed with how good her food smells. Uh, so when she microwaves her lunch, um, the whole office is going like, what, what is that? Uh, and so learning that different dietaries, uh, I'm kind of a meat and potatoes person. Uh, no, I, I am a meat and potatoes kind of person. Uh, so the idea of not having living a vegan lifestyle uh, to me is totally not sustainable, but I've learned from her. And I picked up little things along the way. And that's really what a sustainable dietary, not diet as in weight loss, sometimes that is important, but do you feel better after you've eaten a Big Mac and, you know, had the four uh, all um, convenience foods? Or do you feel better after you have a good, healthy um, uh, meal uh, that you eat well? I don't think I need to answer that question for you. We all know what the answer is. Little changes like reading the side of a box. If I can't figure out, well, first of all, the food's coming in a box. We need to think about it. Um, but if I don't recognize half the ingredients, um, it seems convenient sometimes to get meat that's already been seasoned or somebody's done the prep work, but looking to see what have they put in there? Is that more salt than I need to be eating? So these are all just kind of little things that just kind of incorporate into. And so we talk about sh which diet should you be on? already know the answer. Um, for the American diet, the right answer is generally, there are some few lucky people out there that we should eat less. We should eat less meat, more vegetables. Um, sugar should be a treat, um, not necessarily a large component of our daily routine. Um, and if you go with those guidelines, then you will find that in many, many diets, the Mediterranean, the DASH, uh, the walls um, and the many, many other, the Weight Watchers um, plan, the Nutrisystem uh, plan, uh, all those things that can be helpful for a jump start. Uh, I don't necessarily recommend Nutrisystem long term, um, but uh, ways that you can start incorporating this. I guess I'm in a place now where you don't have to do it the hard way. You don't have to say, as of today, I will have two smoothies a day one meal with less than three ounces of chicken, uh, brown rice, uh, no gravy. Um, and my treat tonight will be grapes, five of them. Uh, I'm happy for those who are able to do that, but making those changes that lead you in a healthy um, direction, I think are important. Wellness, we gotta talk about mental wellness. How are we taking care of ourselves? Um, life just keeps happening. And oh, by the way, we're in the middle of the pandemic. Um, we are bombarded with bad news on the news. Um, how do we get through that? And oh, by the way, well, you're living with MS, which has its own challenges, which has its own, at times, grieving process. Um, how do we handle that? I personally think that I, we would all benefit from seeing a counselor at least twice a year, probably once a month, uh, which I think is probably more important to uh, 
I, I always, I'm just kind of flummoxed with why do we see a dentist twice a year? And yet we don't put that same emphasis on needing to manage our mental illness. Society's just not set up to make that accessible. But one of the benefits of coming out of the pandemic is the resources that have been developed, uh, particularly for counseling virtually, uh, and they're fabulous. Uh, and people have been able to establish um, ways to connect with people, not requiring one-on-one -on -one, uh, time in the office. Uh, one of the people I have most respect for, one of them, uh, who is a fabulous counselor, um, closed her office uh, and now does it virtually. Um, so now we can say, I, I get the challenges of trying to get off work. I get the challenges of transportation. I get the challenges of now we can say you can close your office door um, uh, and have a 30 minute session. Um, that's counseling. I talked about my yoga first thing in the morning and how I can feel the difference. I know there's a difference. Uh, my office knows there's a difference. My husband knows when I skip my yoga. Right. Not quite as sweet and cuddly as I usually am. Um, uh, so nice not to have any responses allowed at that time. Um, but how do you take that time? And for me, one of the things that has become increasingly important is crafting. I love to craft. I have short crafts. I have long crafts. Um, over my shoulder, uh, you'll see plants. Uh, which I think have their own healing. Uh, I can tell them all my troubles. Um, and the nice thing is they don't tell me theirs. I can see them. Uh, the best way to keep plants looking healthy is to cut off all the brown leaves. So all my plants look fabulous because we do not allow brown leaves in my house. Um, it's also something when I need a little treat. Uh, I discovered little, L-I-D-L, uh, Aldi. Uh, little has succulents. $1.99, $2.99, uh, when I need a treat, I can go pick up, uh, if my husband's listening, just one. Uh, for those of the rest of you, it sometimes depends. Um, but I find a lot of joy in that. I started buying myself fresh flowers um, many years ago, usually about once a week. Um, and, and places like Aldi, um, Publix with their three for $12. I think just about all of us can afford a three dollar bouquet of flowers, um, a bloom from a yard or a piece of really beautiful greenery. It's something I've done for myself um, and I've encouraged others to incorporate that. Um, that is part of something you can do for yourself um, that brings you a smile throughout your day. And we need that. We need that. Exercise is very good. I hear runners are much nicer people after they finish running, and not when I run. I'm actually pretty nice before I start running, not afterwards. There are many symptoms that we think about that are unique to, well, more common. I don't know that I always think unique. Uh, more common with living with MS. So when you poll people with MS, and ask them, what is the symptom that is the most disabling, the one that gets in your way of living your best life the most? Um, two symptoms tie for number one, fatigue and cognition. I'm tired, but I'm hoping for a nap this afternoon and I should feel pretty good after that. The fatigue with MS, for those of us who don't live with it, or those of us who care for somebody who has MS, is unique. Uh, if we do it right, because we always want to make sure there's not something else contributing to it. If you have one autoimmune disease, you're high risk for a second autoimmune disease, uh, so we need to make sure your thyroid is doing okay. Um, making sure there's no medical reason why you're fatigued. Are you sleeping well at night? Do you need a CPAP machine? Do you have one and are you using it? Um, but the fatigue uh, has a very, very interesting kind of characteristic to it. So if we do it right, people wake up feeling rested. And then many people will describe that it hits them. It comes on them uh, at 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, mid-morning, 
uh, and then may happen again in the afternoon. Everybody's story is a little bit different. But you don't really hear people saying every day about 11, I just run out of steam. Um, we have many things we can do to help manage that. And people always want to think about what pill. And yeah, sometimes pharmacologic intervention uh, is important. But I hate to tell you this, but exercise, nutrition uh, are also very, very important. Coping mechanisms. Um, can you pace yourself? Uh, this is where I'll throw in a plug for the appropriate assistive device. I get it. Having to use something that others can see, a cane, a brace, um, it's a major transition. And yet the energy you pour out to ambulate without the appropriate um, assistive device compared to the energy saving with using the appropriate assistive device, it's an amazing difference. And so there are times that we need to think about things that we do, how we do them, and to say, is there a way we can do it more effectively? Um, for people who cannot walk long distances easily, uh, thinking about a scooter uh, or uh, a motorized chair, uh, I would rather you get from point A to point B and be able to enjoy point B than A, say, I'm never going to go because I don't want to have to do that walk. I can't do that walk. I feel like I'm holding everybody else back because I'm going to be so slow. So I'm not going to go. I'm going to start pulling back on things that really uh, enjoy, that I really enjoy. Um, so these are all things that uh, can be conservative management, uh, looking at what your specific needs are from your MS. Uh, and yes, sometimes pharmacologic intervention uh, is important. Cognition. People with MS uh, don't become demented in any higher rate than the general population. So it's important to know, although you may feel uh, like you're not as smart as you used to be, it's politically incorrect to say, I feel like I'm getting dumber, but I think we all know what that means. Um, but we know that people with MS can develop what we call processing speeds. It takes longer for that right word to come to the tip of your tongue. Um, I, I'm, I can't, I lose my train of thought. I'm easily distractible. Um, I have to make lists or I'll never remember to do that. Uh, it's not the fund of knowledge. That's what's different from like an Alzheimer's disease. You're not losing your fund of knowledge, but you may have trouble retrieving it. This has been a very important um, landmark that's been added to how we evaluate our disease modifying treatments. Um, it's lovely if you can walk from point A to point B. It's not so lovely if you can't remember why you're there. And cognition is now one of those things that we've been able to incorporate in our office. It uh, doesn't look very sexy. It's a matching test. It's on an iPad that has a cracked screen because it turns out adults are higher, harder on iPads than kids. Um, and when it stops working, then we'll buy another one. Um, that's what happens when you're self-employed. Uh, you don't just go buy things. Um, but what is important is it gives us two numbers. It gives us how many matching did you get correct? And then the second number is much more important to me. If you compare yourself to others with the same degree of education, the same age, how do you compare? Uh, having that as a baseline, having that as something we can monitor over time. Uh, there's a gentleman that I saw, and it's a busy week. I can use lots of examples from just this week. Um, but there's a gentleman that I saw earlier this week who we are working on his spasticity, his increased tone, spasms in his legs uh, that really hadn't been addressed before. It was interfering with his ability to sit in his wheelchair. Um, he's on lots of medications to try to help manage it. Like, so I guess it had been. Um, but it was, his medication doses were at levels that if I took it, I would be comatose for the next day or so. I just couldn't tolerate that dose because I haven't been um, exposed to it. And the only reason he could is because it had been gradually increased. 
And so we looked at how do we manage his spasticity in a better way. Uh, intrathecal baclofen pumps are not new. They've been around since the 1990s, and they are so underutilized. Um, and for him, this was a great option to be able to give him baclofen, uh, the treat of spasticity, in a much more effective way. And the key to it is you're putting the medicine right where it needs to be, and you're, you're not having the cognitive side effects from the medication. Uh, why is that important? Well, he also wants to drive. There's nothing wrong with his arms. Uh, we certainly, uh, there are um, uh, resources to help uh, patients to drive with their arms, not their feet. Um, and uh, certainly that was one of his goals, uh, to increase his independence. And he's got kids and, you know, just life. Um, and one of the things that's been really remarkable, and I've seen it over and over, is that as we transitioned him off the medications that he was taking by mouth to manage his spasticity, how much his response time, he was always funny, but he's even quicker than he ever was. Um, and we were able to use this very simple matching test to show the difference of what his processing speed was before and what it was after, uh, now that his spasticity, spasticity I say that quick three times on a Saturday morning. Uh, spasticity was predominantly being managed uh, by an intrathecal baclofen pump. And so I think sometimes that's the value uh, of seeing someone who has maybe more experience with MS. Uh, one of the challenges with MS is a great one. It is the information is pouring out at a rate that we never had new information coming before. Uh, new options, better medications, we're changing our goals. I can still remember saying, well, you know, you had a relapse this year. Last year you had two relapses. I don't know if we can do any better, right? That's a 50% reduction. We should be happy. That's what we've got. And certainly that was better than nothing. But now our goals are different. We don't want to have any evidence of disease activity. And what can we do to manage it? I don't know where I went on that side point. Is that the Gabbett Penton talking? Um, but really just talk about from a fatigue, a cognition standpoint, um, A, that we're monitoring it, um, that we are in, in research trials and uh, we're currently involved with, uh, I think about 12 trials, uh, 12 plus trials that are looking at um, new uh, ways to treat MS. Uh, but what really stands out to me on every single one of those trials is how the importance of cognition has been raised. Um, and that, that is a priority endpoint um, for the studies. Um, so when we talk about con uh, cognition, we need to think about, is it part of the medications? Um, medications for paresthesias, numb, tingling, um, uh, sensations, uh, they may help with the nerve pain, uh, but sometimes uh, if, uh, it may affect your concentration. I think today is a great example of that for me. Um, how do we balance that? Uh, do we start low and slow and gradually work up? Um, I'd rather you tolerate it and it takes us six weeks to get to the dose we'd really like to get to than to give it to you, boom, and you experience all of the side effects right from the beginning. It's very hard to say, let's, let's just slowly go down to you no longer have side effects. And so sometimes even how medications are managed. Cognition. How are you sleeping? Um, for all the moms out there, uh, there is a real thing called mommy brain. Uh, we're five, you know, 20 years, years away from it, but I remember, well, mommy brain in those first couple of years, particularly after he was first born, chronic sleep deprivation. Uh, I took call for many years uh, and the sleep deprivation from not sleeping every fourth night, trying to recover from that. For those of us who work swing shifts, for those of us who don't sleep well because our legs jump during the night uh, and we have under managed or not inadequately managed, not to say spasticity is always the easiest thing to manage, uh, but we have inadequately managed spasticity um, that we can uh, optimize sleep. The thing with sleep is that you you go to sleep, you go down through these different stages and you have to get down into deep sleep to get that restorative sleep. 
So you can technically sleep all night, but never make it down to maybe you're heading that way and your leg jumps. So you wake back up. Maybe you're heading that way and you got to go to the bathroom and you're back up. And so the importance of sleep hygiene, what is happening during your sleep is a very important thing that needs to be addressed, not only for cognition, but for fatigue. And then guess what? For the rest of us too. All right. Um, and so really uh, focusing on that. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I no longer ask uh, how many times, you know, do you get up at night once? Do you get up at night? I think for most of us after a certain age, the answer is yes. Now I ask, how many times do you get up during the night? And I can't tell you how many times I've been amazed that people say two, three, four, eight. You're not going to be remembering anything. You're not going to have any energy if you're up eight times, four times during the night and go to the bathroom. Uh, so bladder control uh, is a symptom that we know uh, we need to address, we need to be aware of, and to manage. I really only sing one song in the office. Actually, I may sing more than one. Uh, but I don't get any prizes for my singing. But you even know what it means when I sing, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go right now, uh, or you don't. Uh, so bladder urgency, or gotta go and can't get it started. Uh, urinary retention. Of the two, medically, urinary retention is a much bigger issue because it puts you at a higher risk for bladder infections, medically. Um, it's inconvenient to not be able to urinate, but people don't necessarily uh, complain about that unless it really takes time uh, to initiate urination. Uh, gotta go, gotta go right now. One of these days, and we'll get around to my retirement plan, which is the app that I will market to um, pregnant women, people with MS, and men as their prostates start to kick in and they suddenly understand why um, they had stopped so many times because their wife had to go to the bathroom. Um, what a, I mean, what a wonderful app, right? You can get one for where's the nearest parking spot. But I think there's probably even more people like, where is the nearest bathroom? Um, I was listening to Brie and talking about pelvic exercises. I think that's what she was talking about. Inner leg exercises, Kegel exercises. Um, and there are practitioners who um, is, is usually actually a physical therapist or occupational therapist that work on bladder control, bowel control. Um, these people are out there. Um, it's interesting now with the prostate surgery that many of the urologists require men to go through a pelvic exercise so that it will help them control their bladder postoperatively. Um, that's a resource that can be used within us and being able to make those connections. Uh, you've seen all the TV commercials, just like I've seen all the TV commercials. Um, so there are many medications that can be used. Um, sometimes we need to get a urologist involved, uh, but there's a lot that can be done to manage bladder. Uh, and I've always said, I think if you can help somebody, I've gotten more thanks after somebody's bladder has been well managed uh, than I have for anything else. Uh, because that's such a quality of life um, detail, uh, big detail. And so whether that's contributing, you see how the symptoms start to, so you say, I'm tired. Uh, so we talk about exercise and nutrition. We talk about your night. We talk about your bladder control. We talk about your pain, uh, which is always worse at night. Why? Because during the day, it's distracted, right? We're, we are not, we're, it's not quiet. There's no distractions. And then all you have is the pain, right? That's why it's worse. It's not because it actually turns the thermostat up during the night. It's because all those things that can kind of distract you from it to a certain extent um, the, are not there at night. And so being aware of that, how do we manage pain? Um, the early textbooks in MS, uh, I think my first one actually still said uh, one of the you know, one of the nice things about MS, I'm paraphrasing, of course, was that people with MS don't have pain. Apparently, nobody had ever actually asked people with MS whether they had pain. Um, there's some unique uh, pain syndromes um, that happen with MS, trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, not everybody with trigeminal neuralgia has MS, um, but it can happen in more, more, more common 
in people who do have MS, a lightning, shooting pain, um, uh, difficult to manage at times, um, but so needed to be managed. Um, burning pains, not unlike diabetics, uh, the nerves in diabetes, the nerves are injured from the high blood, blood sugars in the legs, in the feet, in the hands. And in MS, there's no injury to the nerves themselves. The problem is in the brain, trying to interpret this information that's coming to it. Um, so different mechanism, uh, but uh, the symptom is the same. And how do we manage that? All of these things are, I just never really understand how somebody sees an MS patient once a year. I, when I discuss with patients, I say, well, you know, when we first meet, if you really, really first meet, uh, we want to make the diagnosis of MS. We want to be accurate. Never like calling people and saying, no, I'm just having a bad day. You really don't have MS. That doesn't go over well. Um, also, making sure people actually have MS. MS is not a diagnosis of, of exclusion anymore. We don't know why you're hurt, so you must have MS. Um, it's a diagnosis of inclusion. Uh, there are specific things we look for to support the diagnosis. MRI, at times lumbar punctures or spinal taps, uh, asymmetric neuro exams, stories of um, discrete neurologic changes that happen over time, and the evidence is seen on the physical exam of the residual behind them. Uh, the progressive symptoms that many people experience of increased spasticity, difficulty walking. Um, there is a caveat that when you listen to patients' history, there you go. And all, all the technology we have today, we still got to talk to you um, and listen to you, which is actually my favorite part. But um, if the story doesn't sound like MS, it's probably not MS. Um, and the pattern, knowing the pattern, I always say neurology is really easy because the job is to learn the patterns and then match, if you can, the patient to the pattern. Um, so the clinical history becomes very, very important and the diagnosis of MS. But maybe that's 5% of our relationship. Well, maybe the next five to 10% is, what's the best disease modifying treatment for you? The good news is we have so many options. Um, I was in training when we got the first FDA approved medicine, uh, beta-serin in 1993. We were just excited people had it, something. Um, and we sort of had, from a physician standpoint, Listen, this is a bad disease. I know you don't feel so good on this medication. Suck it up. Uh, yeah, you're going to have some flu-like symptoms, six with Tylenol, but we got to do what we got to do. That message has changed so much um, with the advent of the newer generation medications. And I mention that because people will sometimes shy away. They say, I was treated with X. Unfortunately, we still see people treated with X. Um, I have not prescribed um, beta serum in I think probably 10, 15 years. And yet I saw a newly diagnosed woman who'd been put on beta serum. Uh, that A, two points. We have more effective medications. Uh, we have medications that have lower side effect profiles. Medications today are not only um, targeting the relapses, the MRIs, but we're really focused on how do we slow the progression over time. From the very beginning, we're thinking about we need to treat today, but we also want to be treating for 20 years from now, 30 years from now. Um, and so I think that, where was I going with that? Um, that's what happens when you do free-flowing presentations. Uh, no, I'm not reading from a page. Maybe I should have. Um, it was symptom management. Yeah, well, uh, moving on from that, but I think it's a very important point. Um, it's so important that I can't remember what it was, um, but side effect management and how that kind of goes into uh, how do we treat people? Oh, that was the disease modifying. That was my next 5% of the time with uh, managing patients. What do we do the other 90%? Hopefully, it is rarely having to deal with things like relapses. Uh, we are really good at stopping relapses. Uh, slowing the progression of uh, MS over time, we've gotten even better with that. Um, but most of the time, the sexy part of my job 
is talking about bladder control, fatigue, cognition. How do we make sure that you're living your best life uh, with your MS? And that's the goal of symptomatic management. That's really where it becomes important. Uh, and identifying the resources in our communities, uh, being able to say, hey, I know we're a nutritionist. Hey, I just met this fabulous Pilates instructor. Uh, I would suggest that maybe you consider that. Do we need to go to vestibular rehab or balance therapy beforehand so that you are prepared to be successful with, uh, 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 you know, with whatever exercise regimen that you want to pick? I don't think I'd be doing my job if I didn't mention COVID. Um, for those of you who have already been vaccinated, thank you. The data for the safety of vaccinations is overwhelming. Um, the, the data for safety for people living with MS, you're not technically at a higher risk for complications related to COVID. Unfortunately, the risk for complications for COVID is not small. And there are whole clinics that are opening up for the post-COVID post complications for neurologists. Um, for those of you who are on a disease-modifying treatment or are living with MS, you do meet the criteria to go get your booster now. Um, they're not requiring anything to prove that you need that. Uh, it's prepared to send letters left and right to support that. Um, but if you are uh, being treated for MS or living with MS, and you've been vaccinated, you don't have to wait to September, like I do, um, to get your vaccine. And I strongly encourage you to do that. For those of you who have not gotten your COVID vaccine, uh, I've done presentations. Stuart has done MS News and Reviews. I always butcher their name. MS News and Views, Views and News. Um, it's done a fabulous job with multiple, many, uh, educational programs talking about the science of COVID, the science of the vaccination. Um, and I certainly refer you to those resources. I've done one myself. Uh, all of the voices that are doing, like, how do we take the best care of our patients? And we have to do that in light of we're living in a pandemic. Um, the information around what medications are safe, is there anything we need to do? Unfortunately for them, um, there, COVID really started out in Europe, right? Uh, Italy had way more cases. Europe, uh, London had way more cases. Australia had way more cases before we did. Uh, New York happened before it happened in South Carolina. And we can benefit from the knowledge gained uh, from those others who live with MS and got COVID or had the vaccination. There are registries that have followed these people that guide our recommendations. Um, I think the challenge is dividing the politics, the you're a bad person, I'm a good person versus the science. Um, and I, it's not too late. Uh, one of the challenges of the COVID, vaccine, COVID virus is it changes. COVID virus has been around forever. Coronavirus has been around forever. It is what causes the common cold. That is the reason why we've never had a vaccine for the common cold. But the challenge is it mutates, it changes. And depending on how it changes, depends on how infectious it is, how deadly it is, how, what's the likelihood that you would have to be hospitalized. You and I both know that if you're living with MS, that a common cold, right, it may take me two days to get over it, may take you a little longer to bounce back. We want to avoid that. All right. We know that the risk of a relapse after an infection is much higher than actually the vaccine. We know that from the flu studies that have been done many years ago. Um, so if I can add one more voice, if I can remind uh, one more person, uh, unfortunately, in the last year, yeah, I've seen patients who've had COVID. I had COVID. Um, we've had staff that have COVID. Um, and yes, there are some people who are lucky enough to get a little sniffly nose, and I'm so happy for you, but there are many, many others that that's not their experience. And we want to take care, for those of you who are living with MS or an on-disease-modifying treatment, I mean, I, I, I put my mask back on, um, uh, but I, I wear my mask for you. Uh, I wear my mask because... I don't want to spread it to you, 
Um, I don't want it either, let's be honest. Um, but it's not so much about us sometimes, that it's about those around us. I don't want my child to get uh, COVID. And so if you choose not to vaccinate, please do wear your mask. Um, please do wash your hands. Please do socially distance. I think, uh, uh, Stuart, uh, confused the, uh, the politics of our governor and um, the number of people who chose not to be vaccinated with the good sense of people living with MS and know what their reality is uh, and saying, well, you guys don't have to wear masks in restaurants. No, we don't. Uh, but I think most of us are not that interested in going to in-person programs. Uh, I'm not. Um, I was doing it for you, but you're going to have your mask on while I had mine off. And then when I put mine right back on and I had all these plans for oh, I'm talking to nobody within six feet. Um, so I appreciate that Stuart uh, and MS Views and News, News and Views, um, pivoted so quickly to make sure this problem, program still happened. And then to make sure that access to the information for MS continues to flow. Um, uh, I appreciate him for that uh, and his dedication and those of the organization to continue to make sure the information continues to flow. Um, access to rural care, uh, health care. Uh, yes, many of you are far away from a large uh, metropolitan city. Uh, in fact, any of us that don't live in Greenville, Columbia or Charleston uh, um, qualify for that. Um, but we have tools uh, and we can use those tools. They were always there. Um, we've had telemedicine for many years. I think I did my first telemedicine consults um, back when I was in the Augusta um, at the University of uh, Greenville University. I don't know what they got, I mean, not Greenville, Augusta University, I forget what they call Medical College of Georgia, places changed their names. Um, I was doing remote consultations then. Um, but it was uh, wieldy, very wieldy. It was big machines and, and the, the technology has brought us to a point that we can connect, we can find resources. Um, and that's been wonderful. Um, and let's try to take advantage of that as much as we can. So I think I could, I'll pause there. Um, and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Stuart, yeah, we've, yeah. Got, we've got, oh, there we go. Oh, oh my God. Okay, Stuart, so we've got the double mask. That's right. Yeah. And I'm in a studio, right? I only put that on because I have questions to ask you about, and people have questions. Okay. First off, thank you very much for that talk, okay? That was very, very good. Everybody, clap. <laughs> Wherever you are, just clap and say you did it, all right? I hear it. I hear it right. in the distance, Stuart. That's right. It might That's be right. the guy cutting the grass, but it's it. the same It's thing. coming out of a cloud like everything mm. else, going in or coming out. All right, so we got two masks, all right? And like if I'm on a plane, which I am flying again, I'll wear two masks. I'll wear the K95 to protect me, and I'll wear the other to make it look better. <laughs> all right, because what are we telling people about the fabric mask versus a K95? Yeah. Are you telling people that, you know, this protects the people that they're around, but it really doesn't protect them? Mm -hmm. Is that true or not true? Um, so it's not true. Uh, there have been many analogies have been made. So what am I telling people? Put on a mask first. Um, uh, I um, sewed cloth masks at the beginning, uh, put filters in the mask. Um, you can now buy filters that you can put in masks. Uh, and I think there is something. I have my, my current um, surgical mask has butterflies planted on it, uh, painted on it. So doing something to kind of take the... I don't know. I don't like wearing a mask. I may just be real clear on that. That is not a joy of my life. Um, the difference between the paper mask, surgical mask, the cloth mask, and the, the N95 or the KN95 uh, is that as you move towards the KN95 and 95, you are um, the amount of virus that can come through uh, goes down. Should everybody have on a KN95? Uh, well, they are a challenge. Uh, for people who have respiratory problems, it's very hard for them to wear them. Um, uh, so I think we want to be as uh, protective as we can. Um, I'm not sure if you're going to appreciate this one, Stuart. I think you probably will. But uh, one of my patients, we were talking about the mask and use the analogy. Uh, if people say masks don't work. 
So if we're both naked, well, not us, well, that makes it weird. Um, so if there are two men, okay, let me take myself all in, uh, and uh, they don't have their pants on and they have to pee, um, there's nothing to protect you from the pee. That's just the regular, I didn't make this up, but I thought it was really good, and, and I'm doing anything I can to get this message out. Uh, they don't have anything to protect them, they're going to get wet, okay? But if one man uh, has their uh, pants on, uh, this is really weird, like, where are we talking about? But anyway, um, if the other man pees, he may get damp, right? But he's not going to be as wet as he was if he had nothing on, right? If both of them have pants on, the pee's going to run down the leg of the man that's peeing, and the other one's pretty well protected, right? He shouldn't get anything. Um, and I think that really is the layers. And the KN95s, to be quite honest, are the best, um, but they've been challenging in accessing them. Uh, and so, in tr so trying to restrict those to those who are healthcare providers, because at the time we couldn't get them. Um, I mean, I really had to go to extreme lengths to get them from my office um, because we are in direct contact. We have to be closer than six feet. Um, uh, we are in exam rooms tend to be on the small side. I don't have massive exam rooms. Uh, so we have to walk into those um, uh, less protected spaces. And that was really the first mandate was to try to protect, save them for healthcare providers. Now you can get a KN95 on Amazon. Uh, you can get a red one, you can get a blue one, you can get a green one. Um, so if you have access to one, uh, then I think you should be wearing a KN95 and smaller. I'm wearing mine to the grocery store because I live in South Carolina. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of people are not wearing their masks. Um, and uh, um, people sometimes like try to tell me, you don't have to wear your mask. I said, oh, but I do. Oh, but I do. And so um, surgical masks, the paper surgical masks are probably better than the cloth mask. If you put a filter in the cloth mask, um, uh, something as simple as taking a coffee filter and folding it, that's better than just the cloth mask. But if you have access to the um, uh, N95s, uh, I would not even think about walking to an airport without an N95 mask. Right. Um, and, uh, and if I can, I much prefer to fly. I mean, much, <laughs> no, I used to, much prefer to drive nowadays. Um, so it really speaks to um, how aggressive can you be uh, to take care of yourself? But because I love those around me too. Uh, it's, it's the same thing. I'm, I'm not trying to carry it. We now know that even if you're vaccinated, you can carry the Delta virus. Um, and I love others enough that I don't want to be a carrier and I don't want to pass it on. Thank you. So everybody should know, I too wear a KN95 when I go into a supermarket or anywhere where there's a lot of people, but I will wear the fabric mask where there's less of a crowd around mm -hmm. and I can keep my distance from people. Mm -hmm. So it is difficult to breathe. So if you find yourself having that big of a problem, go find a corner somewhere where you could just open up the bottom and get some fresh air and then take a few deep breaths and get going again. All right. I mean, it's pretty simple, but at least you'd be saying staying safer than not wearing it. Mm -hmm. All right. We do have a lot of questions and I do want to let everybody know that if you do have anything that you want to ask about multiple sclerosis, the doctor did not have to say that. If you have anything you want to ask her about multiple sclerosis, now would be the time to do it. So get on, find that orange box with the arrow in it, all right? Type out your question and let me ask it, okay? Otherwise, we have do have other questions to ask, and I'm going to get into those right now, all right? Mm -hmm. All right. So Stephanie writes, my question is for Dr. Hughes. I am taking Ocrevus six months before I went for my infusion of Ocrevus, I had to get the COVID vaccine, Johnson & Johnson. I've not felt good since then. Mm. What do you think? It's hard to know. Um, it's really hard to know. Uh, so um, people with MS, people without MS, sometimes don't feel good. The fact that you don't feel good doesn't necessarily mean that it correlates with the vaccine. Um, so coincidence or causality um, in the in the large populations of people that the data is being collected on uh, looking at um, complications from the, the vaccine it is highly, highly unlikely. 
On the other hand, when you look at people who've had COVID and look at some of the long-term complications, um, there's, a, there's a term for it, long haulers, that you're at a much higher risk of having uh, MS, cognitive pro- uh, MS cognitive problems, post-COVID cognitive problems, post-COVID headaches, post-COVID, we saw a lot, we see a lot of uh, embolic strokes. Um, and so uh, should she get the booster? Um, she is on Ocrevus. Uh, she probably didn't get the full response because of the way the medication that I did not on Ocrevus. And I would strongly encourage her uh, to get the booster. Uh, but the other thing is, if you're not going to get the booster, then uh, make sure you're wearing your mask. Make sure those around you um, are vaccinated. Encourage them uh, uh, to get their um uh, their vaccination. I, I, I told Stuart earlier, our goal in the office is if I can talk to people who have not yet been vaccinated in uh, yet into getting vaccinated, if I can answer their questions, put their mind at ease, and I've got two more people out there who are protected. Um, most weeks I do a little better than that. Sometimes I don't, but I have not given up the battle. All right. Going back to the booster for a moment. So people are hearing right now and that the government is putting out for people that are immune compromised to get the booster. Now, mm-hmm. as we do know, everybody does know, right? That having multiple sclerosis, you are not immune compromised, all right? But you could be taking a medication that you're immune compromised. So doctor, can you tell them the difference of this and when then should they be going for their booster if they are not immune compromised? So the reality is we're all gonna get a booster, right? We're already hearing that we're gonna get the booster. Um, I don't think I'd go to jail for this. I would like to get my booster tomorrow. Uh, to be quite honest, I would be front of the line. Um, and so um, because I also believe that the vast majority of people who have MS should be on treatment. I mean, that's a whole other conversation. Uh, I just commented on how fabulous, how much more fabulous, right? We haven't cured MS, but we have made such strides in managing people with MS that it should be a rare person who is not on a disease modifying treatment. That's the first thing. Then we, we, you, if you're not back, if you're not on medicine for your, uh, for your MS, we need to talk. Um, but the other thing is uh, the government's not as smart as it thinks it is sometimes. And so MS, we know that there's a part of your immune system that's actually overactive. We know that our drugs change how our immune responses are. Some of them actually are at a higher risk for impacting the response to um, ability to mount the same response for, for uh, from a vaccination. Some of them we don't really know the answer. Um, so uh, I use I I I'm, I don't think there's a legal thing that I'm gonna get in trouble with. But anybody with MS, as far as I'm concerned, should be getting the booster. And the other reason why is that anything we can do to prevent you from getting a viral infection, and COVID is a viral infection. And we know that's a potential trigger um, for relapse. So um, I am highly encouraging uh, anybody who can get the vaccine uh, to do so. Uh, I don't have MS. I don't have a medical reason to meet that criteria. So I'm not going to step in line ahead of somebody else who meets the criteria. But I think you're very legitimate if you have MS. Great. Thank you. All right. Getting away from COVID for a moment, a person writes person writes. It just jumped off the screen on me, so I got to go back and find it again. All right. Linda writes, I've been on Betaceron since diagnosis around 10 years ago. No changes in MRIs. It is appropriate. To, is it appropriate to stay on Betaceron or switch to a stronger medication? No problems with Betaceron except the Advil before injections to prevent those flu-like symptoms. Yeah. So uh, what I don't know about Linda is how is Linda doing, right? So uh, the fact that the MRI is not changing is fabulous. We never tell people we want your MRI to continue. And we know we're very effective in stopping the changes on an MRI. Um, But the humbling part about that is your MRI may not change, but you can continue to change. So my challenge to Linda is saying, can you walk as far as you could five years ago? Is your memory as good as it was five years ago? How's your hand dexterity compared to where it was five years ago? And if you are experiencing change in your ability to function, and sometimes it can be very subtle, uh, then I wouldn't keep you on a medication that is not uh, impacting that. 
because we do have medications that have shown benefit in those areas. Uh, and beta serin, fabulous first medication to the market, but was not, uh, I wouldn't even put it in the same conversation of the newer generation. If Linda comes to me and says, my MRI is not changing, I'm exactly the same as I was 10 years ago. I've seen no difference in my ability function. Uh, I would watch her very closely, but I wouldn't necessarily automatically switch her. Does that answer the question? So, Linda, so much more to your MS than your MRI. Great. Thank you. All right. Deb is asking, and I'm just going to generalize this for many of the meds. Should an MS take, patient taking any medication <clears throat> for MS have spike antibody blood testing prior to having a third, a third dose, like the booster? Yeah. So the reality is those tests were not designed to check to see. Um, and so we're using tests that were not designed for this purpose and trying to interpret the results. Um, unfortunately, COVID testing is very tricky. Um, the false, the, the likelihood that the person who has COVID will have a negative test, despite the fact they have COVID, uh, depending on the lab, is between 30 and 50 percent. Um, so I would not rely on that. Uh, it is because the abundance of studies that have been done uh, that shows that all of us are losing our degree of immunity. Not that we're not protected, but that we're not protected at the same rate as we were at, at this point, eight months. And then people who are on disease-modifying treatment, um, if mine hopefully lasts the full eight months, we don't know when yours is going to change. And so the recommendation uh, for someone is new vaccine, uh, if your last, if your second dose or your, if your Johnson, your dose was over a month ago, you are eligible for the booster. Um, I would not use those tests because they are not designed for that. And they're not answering the question that we wish, boy, I wish those tests would answer. Okay. Thank you. So what, did, what did, can you tell a person that took the J and J vaccine when there's no booster for that? And is it okay for them to use the Moderna or the or the uh, Pfizer booster? So one of my favorite phrases in the office is I'm not a real doctor. All right, I'm a neurologist, but I'm not a real doctor. Um, so what do I tell that person is, uh, first of all, find your real doctor, which is your primary care physician, and ask them what the best recommendation for them for the Johnson & Johnson, all right? Um, the information is coming out fast. It is changing every day. Um, uh, and people will say, well, uh, and, uh, science doesn't lie, but science does adapt based on new information. And so I think that's one of the things to just say, I'm not a real doctor. Um, I know it from the MS standpoint, um, but I think watch that. And a lot of that will be what your, I think your primary care physician, I hate to say it, they're better educated in that area than I am. Um, but that's where I would, I would defer to. Okay, thank you. By the way, um, there's a new version, another variant that came out a few weeks ago in the United States. And I don't know how this news company, I'm not going to say their name, said that it's going to stay in California. Why should it have stayed in California? All right. Well, I hope nobody from California gets on a plane, a car. Well, it's train. already it's it's already out there. All right. This morning, it's reported that it is now in the state of Florida, of course, and in 23 other states. The name of the variant is called Lambda. L-A-M-B-D-A. And mm -hmm. so you'll be hearing a lot about this as well. But they do feel that the uh, boosters will work for this strain. OK, mm -hmm. just wanted to let you know and get you up to date on that in case you didn't hear about it. Um, they thought it was going to it came out of Mexico and it went mm -hmm. to California and they said, oh, it's going to it's not expected to leave the state of California. Well, I remember hearing that about COVID leaving yeah. Seattle. Right. 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 It's a respiratory transmitted, droplet transmitted virus. And as long as somebody from California breathes on somebody from not California, uh, we're gonna see it spread. And, and, and the challenge is you just pointed out a very important challenge. This virus changes very rapidly. Um, and the common cold, uh, the variants were mild. We were inconvenienced by the symptoms, but the danger of the common cold is very low. Um, there is no guarantee and in fact, we're seeing that as it continues to mutate, that um, the newer variants may not continue. So we're going to have to learn to live with it, really, Stuart. And that's and that's the challenge. So we're going to have to live with COVID, and but we have to respond to it. We have tools. This time last year, I felt very helpless. 
we didn't have a vaccine, right? I was doing everything I can to protect myself from getting it, but I didn't have a way to treat it. I didn't have a way to protect it. I wear my seatbelt in the car every day. I don't know. I know there's a high risk. I'm going to have a car accident one day. I don't feel like I'm going to have one today. I have no idea, but I put that seatbelt on every day. Um, COVID is not like one day I may have a car accident. It's 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 a real and present danger. Isn't that a movie or is that a book? Real and present. That was a movie. That was a movie. Right. That was a movie. Okay. Okay. Um, next, outside of COVID, again, do patients? Coy is asking, do patients age out of taking a DMT if they're older and having been stable for several years? Um. So, as you age the risk of relapses goes down. All right. So if we're just talking about relapses, you probably, after a certain age, not a couple of years, but I mean, 5, 10, 15, after the age of 50, well, 50 is not old, 60, 70, should they still be on medications? Um, and there have been these studies done to stop the medications. And guess what? People continue to progress. We do not have ways of predicting who. Um, and the challenge is that once those changes happen, we can't repair the damage that's been done. That's the challenge of it. And so um, the uh, I don't automatically automatically take anybody off a of treatment based on age or how long they've been stable. And reminding them that if you've been stable and you've been taking a disease modifying treatment, uh, could it be that your MS hasn't burned out, but that uh, your med is working? Um, and that's what we want it to do. Um, but the other things we have options for people who are older that are better tolerated. And so the medical complication concerns, the risk, the ability for people to tolerate medications as they get older. Uh, we now have options for everybody, really. Okay, thank you. Is there any um, science behind knowing if a person who suffers a lot of nights from spasticity in the legs and the cramping of the feet. Is there any science behind the room being colder or warmer being better for them? Um, so, you know, it's funny. We always talk about MS people being people living with MS being very heat sensitive. And for every person that you meet, it's very heat sensitive. You will meet somebody who is cold, very cold sensitive. All right? It just didn't get as much press. Uh, but the reality is it can happen either way. Um, so whatever your trigger is, uh, it's unique to you. And so um, do we understand it? Not necessarily. Is it real? Yes. Um, so if you are more triggered by cold, um, things to do to room, warm up your room. If you're more triggered by heat, what are you going to do to try to cool down your uh, room, cooling sheets? I mean, so, so we, there are times that I don't need the science. I just need to treat what you're experiencing, okay? Um, and uh, the challenge is MS is a very humbling disease. And so, no, I can't explain it, but that doesn't mean I can't treat it. Okay. So there have been physical therapists who have said, though, that people who do suffer from spasticity at night, like restless leg or something similar, should not be sleeping with their legs underneath the cover. <laughs> I, can't, I can't sleep without my legs under the cover. But to, keep it, but to keep it exposed. Yeah. I personally have that I personally have that issue. And if I wake up during the night with the spasticity in my legs, I um, can sleep better the rest of the night without being under the sheet. Okay. Some of us, and it's funny how sleep is a very personal thing, right? Sure. I am sure. not gonna let the, the monster under my bed catch my toes. My feet have to be covered. Um, but um, there are resources out there. I am uh, confessing to be a woman of a certain age. And it's amazing that the tools out there for women of a certain age who get hot during the night, there are cooling sheets, there are um, uh, mattresses. Um, there's lots of things that can be done to address that. Uh, for even for those who, like, I, I, can't, I can't expose my feet at night. What if the boogeyman gets it? So, um, you know, so I think it's, it's uh, lookouts. So once one time we had to really say, like, you're going to get an MS cooling vest, right? Now I tell people go to Lowe's. Turns out nobody wants to be hot. And so there are cooling gaiters, there are cooling neckbands, there are, there are so many tools out there. 
So either go to Lowe's or look up menopausal symptoms and things to be done for them. And there are lots of cooling things out there that can be very helpful. I'm not going to tell you how I know. Okay, that's, okay. that's great. But good answer. Good answer. Thank you. By the way, an answer to your clear and present danger earlier was a book by Tom Clancy. There you go. I thought it was a book before it was a movie. Yes. I'm a little cultured. Yes, yes. Not good. really. But a little bit. A little bit, right. All right. Thank you for those answers. Um, going back to old medications. Um, I was recently informed by somebody newly diagnosed that his patient, that his doctor put him on Avonex. Oh, I told him to find a new doctor. <laughs> I, I, it hurts my heart. So the reason why I say I'm not a real doctor is because I haven't managed diabetes since I finished medical school. And so if you come to me with your diabetes, I'm going to be, wait, I know how to do a sliding scale and you'll do in insulin and no one does that anymore because you have these, I watch TV too, Genuvias and Metformins and uh, there's insulin pumps and I don't know anything about that. I don't need to know anything about that because I also have this recognition that that's not my area and I shouldn't be getting over in there. All right. Um, so many doctors will treat uh, like they did many years ago. And so finding someone, I, I agree with you, I think they need a new doctor um, who has a specific interest, um, is keeping up with uh, the newest options in MS. Um, can, uh, so rather than treating with what they have been comfortable with for years, because the good news with MS is the field is not changing. And we are so much more effective than we have been before. And there have been multiple trials that say this drug beat out Avonex. Um, and you don't want to be, I mean, we're not driving the two, anybody driving their 18, 18, 1987 car? No, because there are new, they don't just keep making the same car. They make new adjustments to it. The, you know, I wouldn't, I, I could never buy a car without a rear view camera. I can't back up anymore, but boy, I don't hit things like I used to. And so why would I keep driving that same car? Still had four wheels, a motor, and it went. Um, I want the newest and the best, and I want to be as safe as I can in my car. Um, and I think it's like, why wouldn't you want the same thing for yourself? All right. Why wouldn't you want the same thing for yourself? And that's why I think these programs are so important to even if we just introduce like, hey, did you know there were other drugs? Um, hey, did you know you had options and that there are resources for you to be able to advocate, learn about the drug? I've never met this patient. I don't know if there's a specific reason, highly unlikely in my mind, but there's a specific reason why Avonex is the drug for you. Um, I can't think of one, uh, but maybe there is, but also to know what are your other options. Right, thank you. And it hurt my heart, so you know I was like, uh -huh. All the Toms, Trishes, Marys, and Cindy's that are out there, I will be getting to your questions. I just have a few of them that were done and sent to us prior to the program beginning, and I have to go through those as well. All right, so um, thank you for the bit about the Avonex, and I, I mentioned to the person that he needs to get a second opinion by a professional rather than yes. just a general neurologist that's out there that evidently is like an ostrich and his head is stuck in the sand or something. All right, um, memory medications, sleep medications, um, what do you recommend for people without knowing them as them being your patient? <laughs> Nothing, because I don't know you. I don't know what your complications are, what your history is. I cannot make a recommendation without that. Um, so no, I don't recommend any specific thing. I kind of touched on that there's pharmacological options. Um, and But I think it's kind of like the last caller uh, or message is I'm not cookie cutter. I don't have a, you say this, I hand you that because there is no cookie cutter for an individual patient. And so we tailor your care to you. Um, and so there is no one recommendation. Okay, all right, thank you. Trish is asking, <clears throat> losing my voice. Trish, that would be di really difficult. <laughs> <laughs> that would be unusual. Uh-huh. Just have to find a bourbon or something to get rid of that. All right, um, 
Trish is asking thoughts about HSCT, and I'll let you explain HSCT, mm-hmm. for hauling MS. And I don't know if she just means a person that's very advanced with MS or what, but can you tell us about this? So, um, so the concept of a bone marrow transplant is that we take your immune system and we give you, we, we destroy the one that made a mistake and we give you a new one. Um, and that has been looked at for many years. Um, the good news is the complication rates aren't as great, but it's not an easy process. Um, I was at a meeting uh, where um, data for another drug was being presented. And the presentation for uh, the new drug, not naming drugs because I'm, I'm not here for that, but to say that we'd, we'd all heard the presentation for the new drug. And then we all went to the bone marrow, the, H, the, the um, stem cell, bone cell, all of this in the same pot kind of presentation. And the good news is people are doing registries. So now people are like doing collaborations internationally. And, and um, they made their presentation. I think it was the five-year data, the 10-year data, somewhere in there. And it, the room was quiet, very, very quiet. And finally, someone said, uh, I think it was, I don't want to throw Aaron Miller on the bus, but I, it was one of them New York uh, uh, MS specialists that just say it like it is. And, um, and he said, so why would anybody ever do this? And what he was speaking to was as we look, I'm looking over my, over the shoulder at the wall of the list of MS trials that I'm doing um, that are so much better tolerated than uh, a bone marrow transplant, stem cell transplant. Um, The medicines we now have that are FDA approved, where the efficacy, the likelihood you would reach, no evidence of disease activity for many is over 80%, sometimes over 90%. And so uh, I think the common misperception is that I'm going to get a bone, I'm going to get a, a bone marrow transplant, whatever form you are interested in, and I'm going to see in, uh, improvement in my ability to function. I'm going to be able to walk when I couldn't walk before. That's not the goal of that. Um, but I will say I'm very excited uh, about a trial that we are participating in. That, Stuart, this is amazing. The primary input is sustained disability improvement. It is not slowing in progression, decreasing relapses. It is sustained disability improvement. And it's not a bone marrow transplant. And the initial, uh, it's a phase two, the phase ones are very encouraging. So there are options out there, but I, I kind of question that is the option, it's a sexy option, HSCT. I mean, it is kind of sexy, um, but not if you're going through it. I will tell you, I've never thought it was a sexy process seeing somebody go through it. It is the opposite of sexy. Um, but is it better than what we have now? Um, I, I, the science would say no, um, but I also say you learn more about what is what are the more recent FDA approved medications. Um, and uh, and we, we're still continuing to try to beat that. We're trying to be able to say, Sustained disability improvement. Um, that's where we're going, right? Okay. Yes. So, Coy is writing that I would be too afraid by HSCT because it's so dangerous, and not to mention the expense of it not being attainable for the average MS patient. Now, this is something. Uh, before I let you speak, yeah. I'm just going to. Somebody on social media hit me up with this with the stars going, you know, places to do these Whoa. things. And, you know, and, and I have to only answer that I cannot agree on anything that they're doing when it's not FDA approved. They're going outside the United States. They're having trials done. Okay. If they come back into the United States, if you go out of the country to get HSCT therapy, what's going to prevent you from getting really bad and your doctor not knowing what the heck was done to you outside of the United States because there's no protocol for doing this? What can you continue on with that about? So there are many things that stars do. Uh, Sometimes having a whole lot of money is not necessarily say you getting the best care. Uh, I'm going to.
point to a very simple controversy. I forget the names, but the, there was a Hollywood couple who say they do not take baths. Um, um, I'm happy for them, right? Um, but, and they can certainly afford the water. So my, my debate against the bone marrow transplants, the out of the country uh, process is not, it's too expensive for you. You didn't hear me say it's a waste of money. Who had, you know, you, you gotta have a lot of money to get that. And if you're rich enough, you could. Uh, that wasn't my point. Um, the safety of going through it, yes, there are people who have to have bone marrow transplants. Um, uh, you saw, uh, you may have watched um, Robin, what's from the Good Morning America? Robin, what's her last name? Robin, uh, who went Gibbons. through a bone marrow. Uh -huh. I think it's Gibbons. Robin, no, no, not Robin Gibbons. She was married to oh, yeah, yeah, a sorry. celebrity person. Um, the Good Morning America woman who had to have a bone marrow transplant after her chemotherapy for breast cancer, right? Uh, that is not an easy process. Um, I have had two people close to me who had bone marrow transplants, um, one for multiple myeloma. It was a life-saving procedure, life-extending procedure, um, and another friend who had an autoimmune syndrome uh, and had to have a bone marrow transplant. Um, the safety and the tolerability and the, so it is not about the cost. It is not about superstars get it. Why can't I get it? Um, really what I'm challenging you is um, the science and saying the options we have now. Remember the, the meeting, the scientific meeting was not about cost, all right? Uh, cost is one of the conversation. Uh, um, I routinely prescribe medicines that I cringe but I know that there are resources, that's my job, if I say, I think you would do best on this medication to close those loops to make sure it's accessible, accessible to you. Um, but it's uh, not everything superstars do um, is the right thing, all right? So I, uh, I did shower, um, but I'm, I appreciate they didn't shower, um, but just because they're superstars doesn't mean that what they do is right for me. Um, so I, we don't take that um, advice in other areas. Be careful with them. Thank you. I want to go look up the name of the person from Good Morning America, but many people beat Robert. me to the punch and they all wrote Roberts. Yeah, Robin Roberts. Robin Roberts. And that's right. the challenge of like, when you're presenting things you know, gonna go like Robin something, uh, Robin Roberts, right? Very famous story, had to do it to save her life, right? Um, yes. Never got a sense that that was easy. No. Okay. Next, Tom is asking, or Tom is saying and asking, diagnosed with relapse permitting MS in 2016. I went on a Baggio. My MRI since showed no activity. In March 2020, Neuro figured SPMS and told me to stop meds. Not been on any DMT since. Mobility, spasticity are main symptoms. They are progressing, slowly getting worse. Should I be on a DMT? Should I be worried about my brain volume? Do you need me to answer that question? I think the fact that you're listening today, the think that you're asking that question, um, you already know the answer. Um, uh, yeah, you should be concerned, right? So there's two things. Uh, the interesting thing with the Baggio um, is uh, although the primary endpoint was decreasing relapses, um, uh, one of the things that was really remarkable to it is really the first medication to show that it could slow progression of disability. Now, um, there are other options and not knowing you, and if you're continuing to progress on a drug, we don't usually say stay on that drug, right? Um, because uh, we don't usually, uh, and with what do we have, 16, more, 20, depending on how you count them, FDA approved medications, there are other options for you, right? Um, and when it comes to MS, we don't give up. Uh, and I think really finding that um, door team that is best suited to care for you, uh, run fast, run fast and get a second opinion. All right. Yeah. Because we can make a difference nowadays. That's, that's what's so rewarding. Uh, and that's what's so heartbreaking. Uh, when I hear somebody just got a diagnosis and they got started on Avenex today, I'm heartbroken to hear that you're progressing and you're off medications uh, is heartbreaking because you have options, right? Yeah. 
Yes. Tom, there are other doctors out there. I really, really strongly suggest you find one regardless of what they are. All right. Yeah. Um, all right. Coy is writing. Hi, Dr. Hughes. This is your old <laughs> patient, Mrs. Johns. I'm like, how many Coys in my life will I meet? Exactly. Hello, please Coy. tell me, please tell me again. Really fabulous questions. Whenever I hear she's asking a question, I'm like, oh, all right. She's writing. Please tell me again the daily dose of vitamin D3. Also, do you <laughs> recommend MS patients to take biotin? I heard it at a previous MS presentation. Thank you and take care. <laughs> it's good hearing from you. So, um, so again, it's not cookie cutter. We uh, dose vitamin D based on your blood level. All right. Um, people with MS um, uh, probably are not. Um, metabolizing vitamin D like other people, right? And so the vast majority of the American population doesn't need vitamin D. Um, but we are much, much more likely to find low vitamin D levels than people living within us. Why is that important? Well, because if you have a low vitamin D, that's been correlated with less control of your MS, poorer prognosis. Um, and so we actually use your blood level. Um, and uh, so if the the normal, the lab will usually say normal vitamin D levels between 30 and depending on your lab, 100. Um, there are recommendations that uh, there are studies to support that people with a level of 50 do better than people with 30. Um, some people would argue push it to 65. Uh, so again, not kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's, I can't just tell you the right dose without knowing what your particular uh, level is. And so um, you know, every multivitamin nowadays has vitamin D. It's good for bone health. And don't ask me the dose for osteoporosis, but for MS, it has to be tailored. Uh, biotin, uh, I, I don't know that I, I, I don't think I recommend it for MS itself. Um, uh, but for people who are experiencing hair thinning, uh, whether they have MS or not, um, then uh, biotin has been shown to help with that. Um, it helps with the Krebs cycle. When's the last time you heard that? It's a, a factor for the Krebs cycle. It helps with the more efficient um, energy, uh, which is required to uh, make cells. And some of the fastest things we have that grow are our hair and our nails, right? We got to cut our hair. We got to cut our nails. Um, and so I use it in a way uh, to manage symptoms, but I don't necessarily recommend it for just you have MS, you should be on biotin. And one of the reasons I don't is that the other side of the coin is that biotin can interfere with certain tests. So um, you need to tell somebody if you're on biotin before you have a thyroid uh, screen done by lab work. There are things because it can interfere with the assay. Um, they can run it with you being on biotin. Um, it changes your, it has the potential changing if you're having acute heart attack and they check to your troponins or the enzymes that go up as the muscle injury, it may cha it may impact the results of that test. So while you're hollering, I'm having a heart attack, you need to also holler, I'm on biotin, so they know what tests to run to see to make sure they do it correctly. So um, it's, there's always two sides to every story. Um, I think it's just important that you be educated for that. Don't ask me what the right dose is for biotin, because I don't know. Um, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't do it as a routine recommendation. Okay. Thank you for that. So we have, um, a question that I don't even know if it's quietly MS related or not, but, and neither did the person, but I'm going <laughs> to read it out to you. And this is from somebody named Cindy. I have a question that might not be appropriate. Maybe you can tell me. The question is, would you consider primary orthostatic tremor, a neurological issue that any neurologist, whether MS specialist or not, should be able to treat. And why would an MS, <laughs> and why would a specialist refuse to treat this neurological disorder? <laughs> um, I don't, so neurology is a very humbling uh, field, right? And I wish that the care for many things. When you say tremor, uh, my heart rate goes up anyway. All right. You say primary orthostatic. I'm like, ha uh ha. -huh. This isn't easy. Um, and I would not at all say, what do you mean just anybody can't handle this? Um, that's a challenging diagnosis. 
Um, and so, and it may involve a cardiologist. It may not be that the neurologist is the only person who's be involved in this conversation. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to say, oh, I'd be a little nervous if I saw a primary, primary orthostatic tremor come through my door. Um, a, what do you mean by that? B, it's not, it's not always really easy to just treat. So, sounds easy. It is so not. Okay. Okay, great. Before I end things, we don't have any more questions, but I do just want to share with everybody. I know a lot of people would like to see MS educational programs happening live in their areas again. That cannot happen unless you and your friends and all those around you start getting vaccinated. All right. It's happened too many times where not just MS News and News, but other companies, whether in the MS field or not, are trying to step into the water gently and bring programs of different um, disease states back into areas. And what happens is we get everything lined up and then a variant shows up and people are too afraid to come out of their homes. Well, you may not be afraid to come out of your home if you're vaccinated. All right. You'll, you'll have I disagree with you and say too afraid. They may be too smart. OK. Um, and but so we want to have a safe environment for people yes. to feel comfortable with that. Um, just even in the office, uh, we have switched back to virtual except for very uh, unique situations. Um, and uh, people will say, well, why won't you see me? I'm like It's not always about you. It's about the other people I care for. It's about my staff. Um, and we have to make hard decisions um, on. Uh, but, yeah, I'd much rather. I mean. I'd much rather yeah. see you in person, Stuart. It's not quite the same uh, seeing you virtually. Um, and we miss that human content. But right now, I, 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 I didn't mean it like they're too afraid to come out. But it, yeah. if more people in their area were vaccinated, they have a reason to be afraid. More at comfort yeah. to be out of your home. Right. right. And sometimes okay. we're preaching to the choir and those who are not. Um, vaccinated, but I think we all have to be part of that solution um, and to try to get one a week. That, that one a week, if I get two people a week, um, I've had a fabulous week and I know I've done my part. And that's something we all have to talk about. Your experience with the COVID vaccine, why you had it, why it's important for those around you to have it, um, your loved ones to understand why you are vaccinated and you need them to be vaccinated. Um, it, it's not always that motivating, like look at what's happening in Florida. Um, but it tends to be much more motivated looking what's happening to my friends and family. But you don't want to wait to that time when the reason you're getting vaccinated is because you lost somebody. Right? Um, or they're in the hospital and all of a sudden you're like, it's close to home. Right. So if you want to see, if you want to see live engagements happening in your areas again, you guys got to start being a mouthpiece, especially if you've already been vaccinated. And if yeah. you're not, then we are really, really asking you to get vaccinated so we can bring these programs back again. And so that way people can have better lives for their lives end. OK, because otherwise this could go on for tens of years. No, but it's tens true. Years. Yeah. I mean, it may be we look back and say, when did we not wear masks? We always wore them. Um, you know, we look across at China that's had the. Um, the avian flu and this, you know, they've SARS and things that, thank goodness, we never had to experience. Um, but they've eradicated those by wearing their masks. Um, and uh, I just I, I just wish everybody safety, particularly as our kids go back to school. Um, I, it, I don't like wearing a mask. I'm very much a more of an in-person person. Um, the impact that COVID has had on all of us and losing that interpersonal connection and how do we find it another way? At first, it was fun doing Zoom meetings. I'm kind of sick of Zoom meetings. Um, but uh, so it is something that we've all lost um, and we look forward to getting it back. But we got to be smart. Um, and um, smart's not always the easiest thing to be. So for those that wrote in that they love virtual programs, we're not taking those away, just so you know. We just want to do some in-person programs. And when we do those in-person programs, we're going to do them with the new phrase called hybrid, all right, which is our old live stream, which is now called virtual, all right? And you do it as a hybrid, so we're doing both. So that way 
we can get a few people into the room that want to get out, that want to come and, you know, see or socialize with some others again that are their peers, all right, as well as, you know, the, the program would be available for everybody else, all right? So you should all know that MS News and News is the leading MS organization in the United States, probably in the world these days, providing virtual events each month, okay? We're doing 10 to 11 programs per month, all right? And that's just pretty incredible. So it we do thank the pharmaceutical industry. We do thank that all the doctors that speak with our, at our programs, and we have to thank the patients as well. Um, they're, they're, um, again, there are so many people that wrote in their questions tonight have all asked me to express thank you to you, Dr. Hughes, for answering their questions. So we want to uh, make that well known as well. And of course, Coy has to keep writing that he misses seeing Dr. Hughes and, uh, and she and the other patients, um, you know, need to have her or be able to see her again, meaning you. All right. Okay. So um, uh, I do thank you for being online today. We've been on for quite some time. I want to thank you for putting in your time to do this. I want to thank all of the patients out there for being part of today's program. And I want to do thank, I do want to thank, not I want to do thank, all those sponsors that are behind me. Wait, which shoulder are they over? Everything's, back, everything's backwards online, all right? So, um, so yeah, they're over my shoulder, all these sponsors out there. There you go. I can't even turn the right way and it'd be the, be the right way when I'm backwards here, right? But we do want to thank all of them for sponsoring this series. And, uh, Doctor, I look forward to having you again. And, yes, Dr. Hughes will be on our symposium. That will be a hybrid event, as far as we know. It'll be hybrid. And if it's not hybrid, it will be virtual. Okay? okay. So that will be in uh, October. But we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Doctor. We're out of here. All right. Be safe. Be safe.